Every step I take, I move my truth. Every time they tell me stop, I use. Every comment, hate that makes my feel gather up my energy and boom. I hear them talking, saying the way that I move is so reckless. That is a part of my mind I've been blessed with. Giving my blood so I am relentless. We're on the Keep Hammering Collective with Michael Waddell. How you doing? Doing good, buddy. So glad to be here, man. Oh, dude, I'm telling you, this is... I don't know. When I think about this whole journey of being a hunter, right? Mm. From where we, where I started, and then I'll just I'll just fill the people in here listening, because a lot of people, I mean, a lot of my followers are hunters, but a lot of them aren't either. So, Michael Waddell, from my perspective, and I don't know what you, what you think, but like, came onto the scene in the outdoor industry, the hunting industry specifically. And like your personality was like one of a kind, right? And so, oh, on on camera, and I don't know, you, I'll I'll mention <laughs> a few different things, but like Michael was like made for entertaining and a great hunter. So there's a lot of good hunters that aren't made for TV type thing. Like don't just don't. It's hard. It's hard. Right. And you got on camera, and everybody was just like couldn't get enough, and. So I'll just do, get the Cliff Notes version, but like there's this award show for that outdoor industry called the Golden Moose Awards. You hosted it, I don't know how many times. I forget, it was, it was quite a few, which, you, which I used to be so nervous. Nobody realized how nervous I no, was doing that. But so good. I mean, you were so <laughs> like made for that. And I mean, I wouldn't say I was jealous, but I was just like, God dang, this guy is so good. Oh, and you, thank you, man. you had the show Road Trips, which... You know, back in the day, hunters, we had one shot to be on TV pretty much as Outdoor Channel. Right. And you had road trips on there, which was like, at its peak, was, that was must-watch TV. I think, was it Sunday nights? It was Sunday nights. It, I think it was 9.30 Eastern, so 6.30 out here, I yeah. think it was. And, and it was, you didn't miss it. This was before, like, D DVR, at least that I had. And it's like, I loved that show. Right. I loved watching you interact with these people. And I mean, it was, I don't know. You're just like, I don't know. It's the best I've seen as far as entertaining outdoor TV. You know, we love adventure and most hunters aren't expected to be like movie stars, but you, you were, oh, and it was man, just like, you. I don't know. I think it, honestly, it changed the industry. I mean, that changed hunting TV, your, your presence in your show. That that's so flattering because it, it is crazy looking back and and uh, and it's a crazy how when my career when my career first started getting to ha have a chance to get going that's that's where you and I met and um and immediately you could tell we had a lot of respect for each other and got to laughing and cutting up I remember you coming through uh, um you were hunting out in Colorado yeah I was too if I remember right, I think Red Aikens a country singer yep. was in camp and you and I both we've always shot Hoyt bows and so. Uh, Mike Looper's in camp and we come by and hunt, hung out. And I remember that was the first time you told me, you said, dude, uh, I man, I've been watching road trips. Like, dude, you really been watching it? Yeah. You said, no, man, I, I, I watch I it all the it. time. And then, then you said, and then a lot of people don't know this. You were the first person ever to write a super cool article uh, about, about me at the time. And then you, you got me on the cover of Eastman's yeah. uh, journal, dude. And I was like, unbelievable. And uh, my wife just framed that the other day. She found a bunch of old magazines and framed it and put it yeah. in like a similar to what you got here. I called mm -hmm. it the man room, you know? And, um, and so, man, it just rekindled a lot of, uh, a lot of memories. And so, yeah, what you were saying about road trips and that, the personality stuff, man, that, that means a lot because I, I was nervous. Um, I think the biggest thing for me, I was, you know, coming from the South, man, we're shit kickers and fun, yeah. funny, cutting up, you know, the old Southern cliches, everything's, you know, spoken metaphors and similes and analogies. <laughs> I mean, he very rarely is it a, just a yes or no. It's right. A, you know, big story. Oh, hell, it's, you know, it's raining cats and dogs. It's yeah. just a toad floater. It's what, you know, a turd floater, whatever. It's always a, and so I, I realized that, man, I was pretty country. And mm -hmm. so when I first had a chance to start, hanging out and, and video and, and helping guide some of the hunters that was on these shows back in those TNN ESPN days. Mm -hmm. And then when I had a chance to every once in a while, I get a chance to hunt, man, I would try to clean up everything. I was trying to speak different. And, um, and deep down I was just boiling with excitement 
And I think it was Realtree Road Trips that gave me the first opportunity that I just realized, hey, man, just just be yourself. You don't have to run a popularity contest. Just, yeah. Just have fun. And from that, I, I met a lot of other people who like to have fun, but also met a lot of people that was very serious and passionate about mm-hmm. it. And so kind of we learned to combine the two. And yeah. uh, and so it's been really cool. And I think, um, you know, if you look at our paths and look at what we've done in our lanes, it's it's been amazing because – I've certainly kept up with everything that you've been doing. And it's funny, I, I brag, like I'll name drop the Cameron Haynes name. I'll say, yeah, man, I know Cameron Haynes. Shoot, man, we, we go way back, you know. And so yeah. it's it's really cool. And um, and so I've, I've heard kind of things you said about me, too. And so it's, it's kind of cool to look back and think about that, that, that we've almost around the same time period started getting this opportunity. Mm-hmm. And yet how humble we were, but exactly the same. Like when I watch what you do. You can see the confidence in both of us, but there's there's this humility as well. Yeah. Uh, whether she running a marathon or, or or you know toting a deer out, you know I, I'm sitting there thinking like, I know I know Cameron can get a truck closer, but I just know Cameron <laughs> enough to know it's like why yeah, I, I, yeah. you know I, I'm, I'm gonna I did this and I'm gonna get this sucker out my way and and uh, and I love that and mm. so yeah. Uh, Inevitably, man, I, I don't know. I guess blessed is the best way I can come up with it. Man, we've been pretty pretty blessed uh-huh. to be in this space so long. So lucky it's, uh, but you know, I just know like being out here out West and then you in the, in the South there, I would, I would see what you're doing and everybody else was seeing it too, because what happens in um, probably into any industry is when somebody has success, people are like, okay, that's a blueprint. Mm-hmm. So what I saw, when I say you change an industry, you changed how hunting TV, it was, it was a bunch of just regular guys hunting. And then, then you brought this personality. And then I saw a lot of people like, oh, I got to be like him. <laughs> and you, you know, you can't be like somebody. Right. It, you're like yourself. They're like them. If, if you got the it factor, not very many people have the it factor. So I saw a lot of people, you know, trying to, to smoke that joke or trying to do, <laughs> have come up with the, like you said, the one liners. Right. To you, it was just natural. Never thought about it. I, I didn't even mean to you say You didn't practice it. in the mirror? No, never. <laughs> ne- never, man. I, I, uh, you're right, though. It's like, man, I, I look back even. I look back on some of that. And even now, I'm like, man, what a goofball. What? Why did I say that? What, did I, what was I thinking? But as you know, when you hunt or you achieve oh. a goal, who knows what you're going to say. Mm-hmm. It's, 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 it's almost like... Uh, it's like, you know, with the NFL players when they score a touchdown. Yeah. You know, I'm convinced that some of those athletes are going to look back at those dances they did in the end zone. It's like, that was so dumb. Yeah. And so I did it so many times just with animals or be there with a buddy. And, and like, I mean, I, if I could have athletically done a backflip, I would have probably backflipped all the way to some of these elk, you know. But I was just, I don't know. I was just uh, young, having fun. And in reality, I think that's it. You know, you kind of keep a youthful energy and – my, my theory, too, one, and I, I can't say I always thought this way, but when I saw su- the success of road trips is it hit me. I was like, wait a minute. We, we are videoing and putting content out there, you mm-hmm. know, at the time on a linear network that, like you said, you had to tune in 9 o'clock. You couldn't record it unless yeah. you knew how to set the VCR. Right. Um, you know, it was kind of like us watching Dukes of Hazard and Dallas back in the day. You had to be you there. You'd be sitting right there. And so— uh, Inevitably, in my mind, I remember one thing I got to thinking is like, wait a minute, we do have to form some type of entertainment, whether it's in humor, whether it's in the ability to shoot, whether it's in the footage that we get, whether it is, uh, you know, literally me trying to follow you up the mountain knowing that I can't keep up, mm-hmm. you know, and, 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 and us laughing about it. And yeah. you end up having to tote me up. I mean, so in my mind, none of it was fake, but it was just real adventures of young men at the time, which mm. now we're close in age. Yeah. Now we're grown men, but we're still older. having fun like a kid. So now that's my idea is the entertainment is it's just, it's like one Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer, you know, excursion. And I, I think that's certainly, uh, you know, when I look at, especially, you know, you and Joe hunt a lot, Rogan, yeah. you can still see that. You see grown men who got a lot on their shoulders, but that moment in time you chase an elk is serious but you become a 12 year old yeah, and you're laughing and you're saying things and you're fired up. You make a good shot. It's real. It's real. It's and just so much, real. so much of life is you're put on an act. Or I don't know. I want to say everybody, but a lot of people put on an act. I have to, 
you know, right. cause you want to just whatever. It's just how it works, but it's so real in the woods, in the mountains, Correct. you know, it's just like you're hunting. If you're sharing that with somebody, you have a share a common goal. It means so much to us. Correct. And then we have a, a new, whatever buddy or somebody you're exposing it to, or somebody who maybe who just shares those same, the same passions you do. But, uh, yeah, it's like, there's no, there's no more real time than when you're in the mountains or in the woods like where you are. And I, I do, somebody did leave a, oh yeah. So this ties into this. How can you, how can men find friendship like Rogan Haynes or a brotherhood, you know, yeah. calling your, the uh, bone collector brotherhood. I know you've said that a lot. And to me, I would say the reason why that bond happens is because it's so real. Have you experienced that? hundred percent. Matter of fact, uh, to a point that I do think as we are, man children that's my wife <laughs> she calls all of us and all my friends uh she said y'all just a bunch of man children and i said wait a minute that's the best compliment you could give us i mean it's not like we're shucking responsibility we all have homes and businesses and things to manage however um you're right i, th I think when you get out and you hunt and you just enjoy the outdoors camps campfires um when we look around and and you know i was admiring uh, here in this, you know, this podcast room, I was admiring all your trophies. And, uh, and as I was looking through the trophies, I saw, you know, a picture of you and I in 2004. Yeah. Well, well, similar to this room, I have a, a trophy room and some of my favorite animals and, uh, and I have some pictures and different things. And, uh, and I got to thinking, it's like, man, what's more important, these styrofoam stuff with elk hides and antlers but the real trophies are these pictures and these relationships, these stories and the, these fun times and how do we get it? And so all of it, the animal is certainly a challenge, but I do think sometimes the hunting industry misses that brotherhood part of it. If you're just one dimensionally desiring a, a huge animal. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that um, we're seeing it more and more in, in a world uh, that that's, that's so connected. You can also get disconnected. So right. there's nothing better then to just go on a hunt. Like we were, we were talking about all the things we like, you know, whether it's elk hunting or squirrel hunting, there's really nothing that <clears throat> really that I could think that we could go do. It might be an animal that, mm -hmm. you know, we could say, Hey man, let's all get to call Rogan and I'll call Blake Shelton. What else? Get Ranella and let's all go muskox hunting. Well, we might all be like, <laughs> a muskox. Yeah. Okay. That's all Tom Miranda hunt them and Jim Shockey. But but immediately the reason we'd want to go is like, dude, can you imagine We're all, all of together. us yeah. and the, and the jokes, yeah. the sarcasm, mm -hmm. the seriousness, the talks about family, um, the sharing, journey, the sharing, every, the whole, all, the whole part of it, not just the kill. Yes. It, and you almost forget. That I mean, you didn't even mention the kill. You, you don't even mention everything. the kill. And, right. then, and at the end of it, because we do have confidence in our ability to shoot our bows or mm -hmm. our ability to, you know, whatever it is we're hunting. It takes a back seat. And so it took me a little while to truly understand that. But it was early into that road trips where I look back and I'm like, oh, my goodness, nobody, nobody even. Um, I think the biggest compliment I ever got um, is the fact that nobody even really knows what I've shot. Like, you know, it was talking about elk and, uh, you know, or animals or they'll say, you know, man, why when you going to hunt public ground? Because they look at us as just kind of slapstick and having fun yeah. with myself, Nick and T-Bone. And I'm thinking, man, all of my big elk could come from <laughs> public ground. It, yeah. but, but I never talked about hunting the public ground. It was just some stupid something Nick Munt was doing around a campfire or dressed up like Elvis and going to the local cafe and being deer tracker. Yeah. And so that's what we highlighted more. And so in reality, you're not even thinking about the animal shot. You're thinking about, uh, man, th them guys are either crazy or maybe they don't like us or maybe it'd be fun to hang in camp. And through that, you create a, a brotherhood. And, mm -hmm. I, and I see that with you and your friends uh, that you hunt with religiously. Mm -hmm. and, and everybody's got a different vibe. Everybody's got a different threshold of excitement and seriousness. And some people can be over the top. And some people can kind of stay very, you know, serious yeah. with, with the hunt and, uh, and for me, I just kind of like it all. I like to not know where that where it's going to take me. Mm -hmm. I, I like the challenge, um, as you do. To you know, maybe maybe I'm going to walk a hundred yards today, but that hundred yards might turn into ten miles. And I'm thinking, holy cow, why did I not 
start running with Cameron when he invited me. You know, why did not <laughs> pump some iron with him? Why did I not? Now I'm sitting over here, this Swiss co- uh, cake up roll leader, and I'm like, oh my God, I'm huffing and puffing. But I didn't know that journey was going to take me that yeah. far that day. So, so I, sometimes you set out and you never know where adventure is going to take you. But through it all, you come back and you're really talking about your friends and think about what we mm-hmm. were doing last night at dinner with your wife and family. We're talking about all these relationships. I, I, I thought about it when I was going to bed. We didn't even talk about what we'd shot. No. I didn't ask you, like, Cameron, how was your year last year? What no. did you shoot? No. It was like, dude, how was this? How was that? Well, mm-hmm. tell me about this. How's this going? And we're catching up on old times, but talking about the new stuff, but it was mostly relationships. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, our, our our biggest trophy room is the people we've met and the brotherhood of, of men and, and women that we've had a chance to be in camp with, I think. Yeah, yeah, de- I, I definitely do, too. Um, I had... I did want to read something. So I was, I did a little Wikipedia type search and it's like, well, what came also was like Michael Waddell's net worth, which I'm not going to say that <laughs> because who knows? Those things are crazy. I they mean, are, yeah. I, I, I don't I read some crazy stuff about me, but I did like this part. It says one of the questions was, and I don't know if this is AI, I don't know where these articles come from, but I like this. It says my, what sets Michael Waddell apart from other hunting personalities? And this is what they said on there. Uh-huh. Waddell's authenticity, passion, and storytelling abilities set him apart from others in the hunting industry. His ability to connect and, uh, God, I can't even read my writing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. On a personal level combined with his expertise has made him a beloved figure. So, that, wow. yeah, that, I mean, and that's spot on because it's like, that's what I saw. I remember going to the shows and you guys, you know, would have this line, but you created this brand. That's another tangent I want to go on is we started off in this industry and we we're like, man, at first it was like, I remember I'd, I got a letter from NAP and they were going to send me some broadheads and a hat. Uh-huh. And I was just like, God, what? yeah, free. <laughs> yeah, this, exactly. This, this is free. And then you started getting a little money. And then you're like, oh, wait, this is, we just do this because we love it. And then all of a sudden you see that there's value in what we do. And, and, you know, we're, if you're got a businessman mindset, it's not taking away from what we love, Mm -hmm. but it's just like, you look through a different lens. And so you have all these attributes, what make you special and stand out. And then how did the bone collector thing come about? Because then it was like, Again, this is from the outside. I'm on the West. You're in the South. And I'll just say that people dreamed of being Michael Waddell because you were having fun. You were, you were, you know, uh, I don't know, just, just, you just, everybody wanted to be your buddy. It seemed like mm-hmm. nobody wants to be me because I'm out here running a million miles a day. And they're just like, no, that sucks. But I, I could be this guy. So how did that whole journey translate into Bone Collector? And oh, the point I was going to make was I would see Bone Collector on freaking everything. Yeah. You just like, your vision blew up. Mm-hmm. Tell me about that. It, it was crazy because like I say, when you when you go back to when you and I kind of broke into industry, um, obviously you as an editor uh, writing, you was, you was already running and, and doing that, that type of stuff for his fitness. However, that was before it was super cool. Well, same with kind of outdoor TV as I was making it. No, nothing was really personality based. I would say the reason we had to make it personality based is because we didn't really have a budget. So if, if everybody was going to the Encinitas Ranch to hunt deer in South Texas, um, we would get to do that maybe, you know, once every once in a while. But it Because might, of money. Because, because of money. It's expensive because it's a premium yes. hunt. Premium hunts That's cost correct. money. Co- cost money or yeah. just to travel to get there. So so David Blanton, who was, uh, worked at Realtree, he was the producer. Our show at the time was on TNN, which becomes Spike TV, which evolved into Realtree Outdoors, was on um, uh, uh, become ES- on ESPN, Realtree Outdoors. And so, when, so it was just when Outdoor Channel was coming on, so it was David Blanton's idea, like, hey, Waddell, why don't you do a show over here or we should do a show. I wasn't signed up to try to host it, but it would come road trips. And I explained this idea because every time I was around a camp where there was outdoor riders, uh, I remember early on Jim Shockey coming to some of those camps and people like Larry Wysoon and country singers. I remember like Dale Earnhardt coming, we'd hunt with him and we would do these shows and they were good. But uh, I do remember like as soon as we turned those big beta cameras off and turned the lights off, campfire, all of a sudden, there's Dale, Dale Earnhardt, the Intimidator, you know, sipping on a little whiskey yeah. or drinking yeah. a cold beer out of a solo cup, and Mark Chestnut playing Hank Jr. 
and my I'm I'm a 22 year old kid and my head's exploding like oh my god I just had a chance to hang all week and there's Larry Wysoon talking about rattling and you know they'd be Jim Zumbo and these legendary writers and yeah and literally I was just freaking out but I remember thinking because uh we're not covering all this stuff. We're not videoing. So that kind of was born the idea of, of real true road trips, kind of behind the behind scenes. Behind the scenes. And, and two, so but with that, it wasn't like the 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 number one thing was what could we go shoot and the trophy animals. Mm-hmm. Um, it was it was it could be like, hey, go frog gigging. Why don't you why don't you call Cameron Haynes and y'all go frog <laughs> gigging? Well, we could have a lot of fun. So it was based and derived that it had to have some entertainment, otherwise it, it wouldn't survive mm-hmm. just on the the animal itself. Even though we ended up really being successful on some mm-hmm. pretty big animals, elk and moose and different things. However, so anyway, through road trips, that success was there. But they become an immediate, I would say, I wouldn't say rub, but but a problem. And um, you and I talked about this a little bit, and, and, and I was working at Realtree. Well, then I started having opportunities. You know, people would say, hey, can you come over and help do this? Or, hey, man, we'll pay you we'll pay you three grand if you'll come over here and do a commercial for our furniture store. I mean, like it was from everything. Yeah. We'll give you a truck if you'll, if you'll come by and do this, this, and this. And I'm like, oh, my God. You know, and like you and I both talked about the humility and can't believe it. Like when you yeah. talk about NAP selling your broadheads. I remember Ron Brothers Game Call sent me turkey calls, and I'm like, I feel like I should meet chicks. Like, <laughs> I got free turkey calls, baby. Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't know it's if like, you, I'm kind of a big deal. Yeah, it's like I'm Hollywood, baby. Yeah. It's like, you know, and... Uh, and so anyway, it was it was odd, and I think that's when it hit me. Uh, and I think that for me, a roller coaster ride changed to where I'm thinking, "Wow, I become pretty famous through this show." I mm-hmm. wasn't, I didn't seek this, just trying to create something cool for the culture mm-hmm. with an opportunity given me at Realtree. But I wasn't making any money, and I was gone. I I, I had a failed marriage. I had a young kid. Um, you know, I, I wasn't being the best person I could be probably out on the road because, you you know, anytime a little fame and opportunity comes, um, you get every temptation thrown temptation, at you. Yeah. So I'm out there and having fun with my friends and, and, and trying to make make sense of it. But then literally, man, I was making, you know, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year, which I'm not saying that ain't good money for getting yeah. a chance to hunt. But I'm looking and, man, there's a big Under Armour poster, you know, in Las Vegas. And I'm proud of it, but I quickly started getting kind of sick of it because I had to even go through a, a policy. Um, if it, something had my name on it, I still had to go through a corporate policy to figure out if that product could be sent to me mm. through the corporate structure at Realtree. <laughs> oh, man. And yeah. so if I wanted to go do, say, the Dixie Deer Classic or the Western Hunting Expo and they want to pay me to do a seminar— I was only allowed to do three of those a year to get paid. So I was mm. kind of micromanaged. So I realized that it wasn't that the people at Realtree were being mean. It was just a corporation. Yeah. And what they let me do, they had to let the person in the warehouse do. Right. Or the secretary. And so. Well, uh, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Yeah. Because <laughs> I, think- I, I remember arguing that yeah. actually with, with Bill and some of the managers. I'm like, look, man, I know, I know yeah. the guy in the warehouse has got a landscaping business. <laughs> I'm still going to wear a Realtree hat. And so. Bill, so Bill was really cool with that. But finally, it was Bill said, Michael, you know, you, you can't go get paid by Bushnell to go do in a Cabela's appearance. Or Cabela's can't pay you to do something. We use you as a tool in this show. And what we're doing is marketing for Realtree. And so you're an ambassador for Realtree. And, and so it just become kind of odd and different. And so in reality, that's where Bone Collector came from, is I said, man, I got to kind of go out on my own. Uh, Realtree and I had some really deep talks, never, never really ever separated uh, because I was very loyal. Mm-hmm. And, and I think I think, too, not not to keep comparing our personalities, because we obviously have our different lanes. But I saw that, too. I mean, you, you worked at the water company for how long? Yeah. Uh, you look around and the same companies that when I met you, you're still working with them. I am, too. I mean, me and you've been with Hoyt how many years? Yeah. Good people. They've been good to us. But. You know, we're loyal. And if you look, a lot of people think, oh, they don't do nothing unless it's just about big dollars. It's, it's not true. Relationships mean a lot. We do have to make a living. But in this case, I realized I had a lot of opportunity going away. And how much do you get a chance to, to be in the sun? So I was trying to keep my humility and be humble and not think I was something big. Mm-hmm. But I also knew that I couldn't be away from my family and see my personal life just completely spiral out of control because— 
in reality, you can't compare a hunting industry to say mainstream, but I was doing as much as I could. You know, mm-hmm. if you're there for two hours and you're signing autographs and you had a booth, you only can get so many people. And right. so in my mind, I'm thinking, man, I'm overwhelmed and broke. And so bone collector was something I was and like, man, hustling. I, I'm hustling, man. Yeah. I'm everywhere across the if country. If you're hustling, you should be rewarded for that yeah. work. It's work. I, I was. It's it, seem, it seems like it's not in a ditch digging, right. but it's work. It was. I work. mean, you're sacrificing. You said you sacrificed a marriage. You had you you know didn't have you weren't being rewarded with money. So it's like no, it re- it's exactly right. And and I was I was being rewarded with my work and and having the comments and the people shaking my hands like thank you. It's, yeah. You know, watching your shows like being in our hunting camp, but we do this up in PA or we do this down in Southern Alabama. You know, I'd go out West and, and man, even the Western hunters like, dude, you guys are funny, man. We'd love to have out here chasing mule deer with us. Yeah. And, uh, and so it was, it was so cool. But, uh, and, and again, I, I can't, you know, completely bring my career on a lot of my failures, but when you're in the mix and you're focused and I've always said, um, you know, you can't focus primarily to make something great. And, and focus on this, there's something that's going to start failing or falling behind. Yeah. So something that's an asset to you, you know, you, you, you'll, you'll become a liability to something else that needs your responsibility. Yeah, and you, I, and you I can't be that. great at everything. No, so, you, you can't. So if, if you're the leader of the industry, you're changing the industry, you're great at that. You can't be great at, I mean, I, you know, you see the great athletes out there, the Jordan and the Brady, and it's like, they were great at what they did. Probably Jordan's probably not getting dad of the year, husband of the year. Probably not. You know, so because. <laughs> Best friend of the year. <laughs> you're, yeah. It's just like you're focused yeah. on your goal. And for some people, they might think, oh, well, that's, you know, why would you be so tunnel visioned? It's just like, because that's how the brain works when you're driven for something like this. You're right. And yeah, so I under, I totally understand what you're saying. It, I, and I struggle with all that, the, the emotional part of it. Um, like I said, it, it, that part of it was tough for me. And so, you know, for Bone Collector, I was like, man, I got to do something. And uh, and actually, the first company I really talked to, um, I had a chance to work with a company, uh, Gander Mountain had the stores. Mm-hmm. They wanted to do some stuff, and they were trying to get more people in their stores. So I had a chance to do a deal with them that was financially lucrative. And then I sat down with the people at uh, Thompson Center, and um, where Bone Collector was really born, they wanted to do a, a Michael Waddell edition muzzleloader. And ironically enough, I didn't really do a lot of muzzleloader hunting because, mm. um, you know, I loved to bow hunt. I right. love bow hunting. And, um, but at the same time, I'm like, man, I'm trying to make me some cheddar. Yeah. I'm trying to make some cheddar. And I remember we were shooting this gun on the range, and we'd spent two days uh, up in their factories and looking, and they were showing me all these new frames of guns. And we went out there and shot these guns. And, um, and I said, man, I just don't want to – I don't know that I want to call it the Michael Waddell edition. I said, you know – maybe that'd be a little shallow. Maybe I, in my mind, I don't know why it come to my mind. I'm thinking Jim Shockey would never shoot a Michael Waddell muzzleloader. Mm -hmm. You know, in my mind, I kept thinking, I don't know why I thought of Jim um, because, you know, he's a personality. He's kind of alpha dude. And he was with Thompson center too, right? He was with Thompson center. And, um, and at the same time, you know, they had the encore and all these guns. And so I, I remember I told Greg Ritz at the time who, who was, working or I think you might've owned the company. I said, man, I, I don't, I don't want to call this gun to Michael Waddell edition. And they said, man, it's the easiest deal to sell. And, um, so I'm shooting this gun. I said, but this is the gun. This thing is so freaking accurate. I said, I don't know what we call it, but it's, it's damn sure going to be a bone collector. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then it hit me. I was like, Oh my God, why don't we call it the bone collector? Mm-hmm. And that ain't necessarily Michael Waddell, but bone collector is a cool name of a gun that maybe my friends in the industry, because another thing, psychology, I realize, and and, and I saw this uh, with you and your success, a lot of friends that you have that are real close with you, all of a sudden when your opportunity comes and maybe you break through and you're starting to get public attention, mm-hmm. corporations' attention to where they are wanting to pay you to come do this, to do that. I notice in the industry some of my better friends started not invite didn't want me around and yeah. I'm like what did I do I didn't do nothing yeah and and it hit me it, it you hit, won <laughs> it yes it hit yeah. me harder I literally would be somewhere and I'd have a huge public uh kind of fan base of people I could hang with and party with but I couldn't go like man why not where why didn't they call me they all went to dinner mm-hmm. and and it's almost like they almost told me I never told them that they were frustrated with maybe my success. I don't mm-hmm. know if it was envy or jealousy. 
And it took a toll on me psychology because I didn't understand it. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I could sit back, you know, from a from a high perspective and see that in your case, sometimes it's like, you know, you was over here editing, doing this. They're like, how is Oh, Cameron's going to run a little bit. Now mm -hmm. he's working out. So he, yeah. I remember Cameron when he was this. I remember I had a lot of that. I remember Waddell when he couldn't afford this or that. And so uh, I, I know I'm rambling going a bunch of different directions. But Bone Collector to me was trying to figure out how to harness opportunity. I was learning business and trying to figure out. I understood the licensing business from mm -hmm. Realtree. Right. And so that's what it was. And But I realized that I couldn't do it um, by myself. And so that's where the Nick Munt and the T-Bone Turner came. And then also where our, I was also looking for somebody I thought that had one uh, fun, crazy, would love them in camp personality, yeah. but also legitimacy in their field. I mean, right. obviously T-Bone has never scaled a mountain. I mean, from yeah. when he was a kid to, to now. But man, he, he reminded me a lot of being at the bow rack. I yeah. mean, he could set that. They'd still be over there. Him and Wayne still be talking. <laughs> like we, we would not have got T-Bone and them separated yeah. from the bow rack last night. Oh, it's an art working on those it's bows. Art. And yeah, those they, guys are oh, they're like, so good. They're like, you know, Picasso's, you know, when it comes yeah. to that. And, uh, and Nick was a, he was a guide out West. He's from mm -hmm. the West and just funny, almost a Jim Carrey type of personality. And so I thought, man, these guys would be perfect to, be able to help me with team. this and, and I could I could figure out a way to help them financially and 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 help them also secure some endorsements and to work and to go help some other companies that yeah. I knew that they was needing these things. And so that's really where Bone Collector came from. And I quickly after thinking that we should call that muzzleloader bone collector, I remember calling the guys at Thompson Center like, look guys, I still want to call it bone collector, but I think there might be something bigger. I'd like to maybe do a TV show. And so I went and literally got it trademarked and mm. thought that that could be our show. And I also was so, so hard wanting to create something bigger than just, you know, Michael Waddell. I wanted it to be, you know, kind of like Bill had real tree mm -hmm. or, or, you know, uh, feel whatever, uh, feel what, who he's got Nike. It, it, yeah, you know, so Phil I was Knight. trying, I was, yeah, Phil Knight has Nike. I mm -hmm. was trying to, you know, Kip and those guys had Under Armour. So in my mind, seeing all this i was that was my attempt to yeah think i was a businessman but it was fun it but it also got out of hand too because like anytime you get something you, you know it's easy for it to get prostituted out a little bit it yeah. got a little off the track because people were i had a lot of people coming in and mm -hmm. had some bad situations bad business and so now i'm finally kind of getting back to really understand it all and mm -hmm. uh, have no regrets but uh it, it's definitely been a ride it's been a cool ride today's episode is brought to you by eight sleep the high-tech solution to your age-old sleeping issues. Eight Sleep's pod cover slips right over your mattress, bringing heating and cooling tech that keeps you comfortable and sleeping deeper for a better, more restful night. You would think after hammering all day, as soon as I lay my head down, I fall asleep, but it's quite the opposite. It's truly mental, and I never stop grinding, even in my sleep. To top it off, I frequently wake up hot, and when it takes you forever to fall asleep, that's the last thing you want. The Sleep 8 has hacked my sleep and kept me asleep throughout the night thanks to its thermal regulation and cooling setting. The pod cover will improve your sleep by automatically adjusting your bed's temperature based on your individual needs. The cover can be added to any bed like a fitted sheet and allows you and your partner to cool or warm your side of the bed as low as 55 degrees and up to 110 degrees. There's no better way to improve your day-to-day -day life than better sleep. And the easiest way to do that is with 8 Sleeps Pod 3. Start the new year right and invest in the rest you deserve with the 8 Sleeps Pod Cover. Go to 8sleep.com slash cam and get $200 off plus free shipping on the pod cover by 8 Sleep. Ketone IQ is my podcasting superfood. I'm no Andrew Huberman, so talking for hours actually takes a lot out of my brain power, which I feel like Ketone IQ actually helps with. Ketone IQ is a clean energy boost without caffeine or sugar. It increases your blood ketone. I'm not on a keto diet, but by taking Ketone IQ, I can achieve the desired focus and energy for explosive workouts that ketones typically provide those in ketosis. You can find Ketone IQ at your local Sprouts or online at hvmn.com and use code CAM, C-A-M, for 20% off your first order. Your story there reminded me of uh, when you talk about your friends or the people close to you. I remember mm -hmm. I, it was Thanksgiving Day 
and I saw this article, I still love magazines article, but from one of my friends had one of my spot hog sites and, uh-huh. and it said, you know, seven deadly pins and it had my name on the side of it and they had blacked out my name. This, Are is, my, you this is my buddy from, you know, that we hunted together. And I was just, I called him and I'm like, what's this about? And it was just like, I still remember that. It wasn't I know even... that side. I shot, I kid, I shot <laughs> yeah. that. I was telling you, I shot that side. It had seven pins that kind of bit yeah. inward. Yeah. 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 And, and so that, was, that wasn't this house. It wasn't the house I lived at before. This was years ago. And I still remember mm-hmm. how that felt. And I'm yeah. like, I thought, I thought we wanted each other to win. Correct. And, and I'm like, it was weird, but that's where the competition comes in and, and, in hunting and, just men in general are, are competitive with right. each other. So there's going to be that. I understand. I get that. That's fine. That's cool. That that's, I'm, fun. that's actually fun. I I've mean, been competing my whole life. So I, I'm good with here. that. But I thought we wanted each other to win. I mean, you can still compete and still everybody win. Yeah. So that was, that was weird for me. And then I think part of like a lot of, and I can't speak for you, maybe, maybe you can address this, but a lot of like after that, or there's a, a period in there where I wanted to win just to prove people wrong. It's like, a oh, you, fu- you fucking doubted me? It's, okay, hey, let's, man. let's see what you think of this. I love it. And then, you know, once we get older, then it's just like, okay, now I want, then I wanted everybody to win. Rogan kind of taught me this. There's enough cake for everyone. Yeah. But there was a period there where yeah, I was like against everyone. I, I, I don't disagree with you. It's, it's so strange. Uh, I don't even think I realize this. And, and obviously we are talking about it, but you know, prior to us having this official time to be on the collective together, uh, we talked a little bit about that, just catching up. Cause man, I hadn't had a chance to really see you in a while. You know, we'd run at each other. I'd always, every time I'd see Cameron, I remember my, my thing was, cause you was doing, I'd always jump down and do a couple of pushups <laughs> yeah. and people would laugh and we'd hug and you know, yeah. you'd have a line of people and, and, um, j- just kind of sticking with mm-hmm. my personality and yeah. our relationship. And, uh, and so inevitably I, I, I did learn the same way, uh, Cameron on competition and and I'm still competitive man so highly competitive but I'm also uh now I I, I definitely have a lot of uh I, I, the word ain't empathy but but I want everybody to win I mean I, I do believe in the you know the tide raises all ships right and so yep. when now when I see something and I like it it's somebody young on YouTube and I've kind of always had that but there was always a really competitive side yeah. of me like I see them coming on. Yeah. What are they going to take from me? I might have to shoot a little longer shot. <laughs> yeah, or I, might to, yeah, exactly. I might go back and win another championship in turkey calling. Or maybe yeah. for you, it's like, I'm going to go show them I'll, I'll win another marathon yeah. or strongman, whatever it is. And so, uh, yeah, me and you sa- ch- uh, share that same spirit there. Um, but I tell you, I, I will say in the end, the biggest thing I did learn through the success is I think you meet, every, I'd always kind of thought you met your friends at the bottom, like mm-hmm. in the toughest times, which... Um, I, I think there is some truth to that, but I kind of learned you meet some of your better friends kind of at the top, the ones that have the security to celebrate you, the ones right. when you can call and say, you're not going to believe this deal and contract I got, kind of like an NFL player who maybe just signed with the Patriots. Yeah, There's only a handful of friends you can say, you're not going to believe this. They're going to pay me this for this amount of years, and they're going to allow me to do this, this, and this. For somebody you know, outside of your family that you can call – and they literally are so emotionally excited for you that they're like, get your butt over here. We're about to eat a ribeye steak and drink a cold beer. Mm-hmm. Congratulations. Um, I learned that those were people who really loved you yeah. and really were very excited, not because of maybe the money, because they know you enough to know that this was something that you either didn't see coming or a goal that you always had, whether yeah. it's killing a big elk but you see the shade, you know, you can go kill a giant elk. What's the first people say? Must be easy on a farm ranch. Yeah. You know, must be, well, must be easy with a new bow. Must, must be must easy. Must be nice. Yeah. Must, I love it. <laughs> I love it. Must be nice. Exactly. Yeah. Must be nice. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I'm thinking, where have we got to where it's just so incredibly hard to say congratulations? Yeah. Good, good job. Good job, buddy. <laughs> you accomplished a goal. Yeah. And, uh, so anyway, uh, no, I agree with you hundred percent, man. It's, and it's an odd journey. I think for me, it was very awkward. I, I, I was blindsided by knowing that that part of it would come. I did not know that. I, I no. thought, I thought friends, I, I, you know, I thought I could come to a friend and say, you ain't gonna believe it, dude. 
man, I just killed a 180, and man, I got $10,000 last week. Yeah. They paid me $15,000 for the Dixie Deer Classic. Me come hang out and do a seminar and talk about turkeys. Yeah. And I thought people was like, you kidding me, dude? <laughs> I, I really thought that's what it's going to be like, like an eighth grader talking about, you know, a sellout. Sarah, no, Sarah, you're, Sarah Chick. Yes. You're in the a box. sellout. And, yeah. And, and, and now all of a sudden, like, well, you know, yeah. Why don't y'all go on over there? We're, we're going over here and eat the pizza. That's all we can afford. <laughs> I'm like, bro, I didn't mean it. That. Yeah. It's weird. I, that's, I, you know, when I think about the, the people who've always had my back, or not always, but Roy definitely got me started bow hunting, always believed in me. And then Joe, like mm -hmm. if I say, you know, he wrote the forward to my book, which, at, which changed the trajectory of the success of that book because my advance was going to be here. And I said, oh, by the way, Joe Rogan said he'd do the forward. It's here. You're like, right. Yeah, like $200,000 yes. because just because he said that. And he, so he says that he's just as happy as I am. I know that for a fact. He might even be happier. And so, and I feel like I've had that, like when I see somebody succeed now, I'm like, I'm just, I'm just as happy as them. Yes. Or you take somebody hunting and they, they succeed and you're, you know, you want it as, is bad or more than they want it. And so, but I've, I've, you know, I've been the guy who was jealous of others mm -hmm. it's and it's just, it, hard I, not to be, I, I think this arc that we're on, it's been, you start in one place, nobody believes in you. You can't, you know, you yeah. can't believe you got this opportunity. Then you deal with the hate and then you're like, man, this is how blessed are we? But I that comes so. with maturity. No doubt. And, yeah. and, and you don't lose that, uh, competitive spirit. And mm -hmm. like you say, I, I've always thought there's a fine line between say confidence and maybe arrogance or cockiness and, and humility. But at the end of the day, it's, it's almost like a very confident humility. Um, I, you know, I, I thank you and I both have possessed that. It's like, you know, we're, you know, we, we're like very thankful and blessed, but like, Oh, well, where's the finish line? Yeah. Who, who, who do I got to beat? Right. You know, and, and, um, and yet, you know, you, you kind of understand what you are good at and what you're not, and you understand your lanes. And, um, and I think that's just it, you know, uh, and for me, I've learned how to really celebrate the people that, that go in these lanes, but it's very similar. Just like you was talking about road trips. You're right. I remember looking back and I'd be sitting there watching outdoor programming and somebody like, man, this is a freak nasty, or I hammered him. Yeah. And one is it made me feel stupider that I said that, <laughs> but I even felt more goofy for the guy who said it, who yeah. kind of ripped it. And now, I, I mean, to I me, saw... Yeah. you were natural. <laughs> they were trying. You know, you can tell when somebody's trying too hard. Right. That's what I kept seeing. It's yeah. like people wanted to be like you. And it's just like, you're not like Waddell. That, and that was odd for me. But then likewise, I've seen it where, where you know, what you do in the fitness and health which it, it should be, you know, what you do is inspirational. People should want to get out and take care of themselves and run and be in shape. But then you'll see the same type of yeah. vibe to where, wait a minute, this guy ain't sincere about this. <laughs> Th this ain't Cameron. Yeah. This, this guy is, it, this guy's trying to be that, but it would be similar to me mm -hmm. to saying, wait a minute, I've always said goofy stuff and had fun in hunting camp and been laughing and cutting up me and Cameron friends, but I think I need to, I'm going to be, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start taking a rock up a mountain like Cameron, you know, where, where if you look at our relationship, I love it. Like I'll read. And if it ever comes up, you and I, I there was one guy, it was on a radio show or a podcast, something, somebody said, dude, I've heard comments that man, Cameron Haynes could, he would eat your lunch elk hunting. I said, absolutely not. I said, if you look at my waistline, I'm the guy that eats Cameron, Cameron's lunch. I said, matter of fact, I said, I probably, I said, me and the Cameron don't um, elk hunt as much together because he don't pack what I like to pack in a, in a, in a, in a lunch. And th they just got to laughing because they got the, they got yeah, the joke. And right. I said, no, I said, dude, can't, that ain't, that ain't Cameron and I's relationship. I said, you know, Cameron and I would have probably some of the funnest time elk hunting. I said, because you would combine the two skill yeah. sets and my god nothing would be safe because right. camera could run around to the back side of the mountain go up the top and look <laughs> and you know i'm a caller by nature and kind of philosophical i said you combine the two of us man it might be illegal to hunt yeah. those elk <laughs> yeah seriously i said but it would just be a lot of fun and and i said in in reality i said but that's no we understand we understand lanes we understand what we're good at and uh 
And, and that's what a lot of people, I think, is insecure. They don't understand that their biggest blessing is who they are. Right. And they can't be secure with that. They feel like it's, it's got to be something more. If I can be like this person, be like that. And there's nothing better to be inspired because, I mean, I have a lot of people that inspired me. You know, we, we, we was mentioning Chuck Adams and yeah. some of these people that, that uh, when we were kids watching these outdoor shows and uh, we was talking about even the UFC, the Hoist Gracie. I know. All this, I mean, it's like they all inspired us all, but we're well, still us. You know, and, and thinking of that, too, I can't I was just going to say that, you know, I've I've read captions or read things and I'm like, man, did I write this? Is this? No, it's this guy. But these are all the things I've said. Yeah. It's like, I thought I wrote it, right? So, And then I was thinking, like, I was going to throw shade on that, you know, for, you know, trying to mimic what I do or whatever. But then I think back, because you just mentioned it, on Chuck Adams, Miles Keller, yeah. um, Jim Shockey even. Jim, I would yeah. do what they did. I wanted to be like them. I mean, Miles Keller would never smile. He had an XI legend bow. I got an XI bow. I think Mark Garcia was at... XI at this time. And I was like trying to get a bow. Um, Jim Shockey had the bandana. Yep. I got kills pictures up old pictures here with the bandana. Cause I don't, Jim, Jim, Shockey Jim Shockey was the man. Um, so, I mean, I have emulated a lot of people too. And then to your point, yep. you kind of find your lane and then yeah. you're not trying to be like other people. If you want success, you're like the best version of yourself. Yes. And nobody can mimic that. And that's where you have success. But that's I think when you're awesome. young, you're trying to figure out where to go. You are trying to figure it out. It's funny. I saw a picture of me. Uh, I was this chubby little redneck kid, and I had a had a deer, and I had a, a green toboggan on or, you know, hat like Chuck Adams. Chuck Adams, yeah. Absolutely. He was my hero. <laughs> I had them double X78s, and yeah. I read every article. And Those uh, are super slams, right? The super slams. Yeah. That's right. And you could get those Eastons in autumn orange, and, mm -hmm. oh, man, and you could get those— uh, I think it was, a, was it American Eat? What was American, the cheaper, which you can buy them in onesies, like Marlboro's. Oh, cigarettes. the Arrows? Yeah, it's like an American Eagle, I think it was. I would get the Game Getter 2s or something, yeah. just a cheap one. They cheap were cheaper. Ones. Wasn't it like 2117s? Or yeah. I remember getting those 2413s and just, again, just feel like I need to put it in my window of my truck and show people that old Martin Pro Eliminator ride now. I know. Back there. Like, girl, I'm rich, <laughs> you know. But, uh, God, it's yeah. amazing, man. I, I love it, though. Fun yeah. stuff to talk what, about. What uh, what picture of Chuck, if you think of Chuck Adams, what picture comes to mind of his? Mine is that big brown bear. Me too. Is it I really? Getting, yeah, the one on Kodiak. Dude, and he's me sitting too. Back, and I remember reading it. They, he said it might have been 1,400 pounds or something like that. And Giant. he's got his his bow sitting there and he has, you know, the big, I don't know what arrow, 2314s maybe. Yeah. But uh, that picture, I was just like, what kind of animal is this? It, it's just like it, it's prehistoric, seen, it looked like. Yeah. And that's the picture of and Chuck. And paws, you can see those. Uh, yeah. And the, the claws. Yes. The claws yes. coming out. And it's like that, if I think of Chuck Adams, I think of that. Dude, and yeah. I also remember reading articles about him. I've talked about this too. It's like one thing that, it, that I'm very passionate about is celebrating the history of of archery and bow hunting yep. because it kind of pains my heart and it's probably all old fucks say shit like this but it's that people younger guys right now might not even know fred bear chuck adams some of these legends yeah. in our sport like you know if you say chuck adams i'd be like Who? oh yeah well you mean i know chris b you know, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Or like, a, or like you mentioned, Miles Keller. I mean, yeah. you talking about OG, man. Miles I know. had that blonde hair and just I know. never smiled. Looked like he just got out of prison. Stud. <laughs> he went and killed giant white tails. He, he had that look. He did. Yeah. And and so it, it kind of, it's it hurts a little bit that the history isn't celebrated as much. Um, so I try to do that here. Sometimes I just read articles or old books. Like I had Life at Full Draw that I talked about here, Chuck's book that, that I absolutely loved. I think Greg, Greg Gushow wrote that one, but, uh, yeah, the, the history of it. Um, so, and you mentioned this earlier, you keep track of like the younger guys coming up who, mm -hmm. who catches your attention? Um, there's actually a lot. Um, there's a lot that even, I don't even watch a lot, but I like what they're doing because they are creating a lane mm -hmm. like, uh, the hunting public guys. Uh, I've seen, they've had a lot of success. They seem to be celebrating that, uh, I don't know, not necessarily the biggest animal, but just what I think is really relevant. And it is that brotherhood of fun mm -hmm. or just, you know, let's go hunt some public ground, get some Vienna sausage and, you know, some, yeah. some whatever, what you can find at a little local convenience store and go camp and go chase some stuff. Uh, 
the Seek One guys seem to be doing a, a, a really good job of, of understanding how to bring some entertainment yet still shoot some uh, trophies. Um, there's some new stuff. I like Cody Robbins. The, the guy, you know, he's doing some cool stuff up in Canada. There, there's quite a few, but I would say now, you know, if you look at some of these, you know, I guess if you want to call it influencer, social media, YouTube, uh, you know, you look at what Outdoor Channel is, that dynamic has changed. There mm-hmm. is uh, a My Outdoor TV app, which you can download, which is unbelievable. You can go watch yeah. anything you want to anytime. And yeah. there's all kind of cool archives of Hunt. But, you know, there's a lot of the, the newer generation producing stuff on YouTube. And mm. So anyway, there, I think there's a lot out there. But with that said... I, I am a little concerned as you are, and I've often thought maybe I'm just an old codger, <laughs> and I'm you know I'm getting to be that granddaddy you know yeah. older uncle that's like got to get say off something my lawn. negative. Yeah, and I'm trying to keep <laughs> that positive energy and vibe going, but then I'm like, I, I don't, and maybe this is uh, the fact that you know at, at heart you're a writer. Um, mm. At heart, I got my first outdoor entertainment through reading articles, and so. I don't know if something sinks in when you read something to where you become a bitter student of it. Mm-hmm. Now everything's moving so fast that I think sometimes we got so much that it's too much. And there's a saying, you know, less is more. I think in our time there was a little less, but equaled more passion and more of a student of the game. And I do look at our generation. Uh, we were students. You know, I know Miles Keller. I know back and forth. It broke my heart when Noel Feather was killing those deer in a fence, you know, yeah. in, in a pen. And, and he was my hero. But I can name so many names. I mean, Bob Folkrod, R- Roger Raglan, who I still adore, man. Just, a again, personality, funny as crap and good. Um, but inevitably, I don't know if I necessarily see as exactly the way we went about it to where, to me, when I look back in turkey calling and – I think of Dick Kirby or the Paul Buttskies or I think about what Toxie Hayes accomplished in camouflage and Bill Jordan in camouflage. I have so much respect and I, and I hope that we don't lose that history mm-hmm. of respect. It's not like me or you or anybody that might be in this that needs a certain respect or just, but I think to be deep rooted in something, you got to know a little bit of the history and be a right. student of it. There's no way you can ever play the game of basketball and not understand that it was a Michael Jordan or a Dr. J or right. a Dominic Wilkins. How do you play hockey and not know a Wayne Gretzky or think about NASCAR and lose the legendary status of a Dale Earnhardt and, you know, Bobby Labonte, whoever it might be. And so uh, I feel like a little bit of that loss, they, they don't know. And I think people should study it. They should mm-hmm. read the uh, memoirs of, of Fred Bear. They should yeah. go read Life at Full Draw by Chuck Adams. You know, they should go read – you know, your book, you know, the, the first, you know, when you was talking about backwood, you know, backcountry, back country, you yeah. know, hunting, I should read that book. You know, I did a book, it was in 2006 or seven, you know, life lessons from Booger Bottom. It'll tell you a lot about our road and what it was then, where it is now, but where they're at now is going to be different 20 years from now, yeah. 20 yeah. years from now. So, um, I was going to say, uh, I was going to mention, uh, how do you see today? We can reach everybody. Social mm-hmm. media is available to everybody. Hunters have, for many years, we preach to the choir. Mm-hmm. If you're in outdoor life, if you're in Peterson's bow hunting, if you're in Bow Hunter magazine, you're you're talking to bow hunters. You're writing for bow hunters. If you're on Outdoor Channel, that's for hunters. Correct. You know, no no anti hunters watching Outdoor Channel. How do you see it now? Where is it an opportunity for us to share what we love in our lifestyle or is it going to be the death of hunting? Because we can't figure out yeah. how to share it to where people who don't understand it aren't appalled and want to do all they can to end murdering animals. You know, how, how do you see that sweet spot of growing what we love, sharing what we love or ruining what we love? Yeah, I think it could go either way. And I think it has gone both ways, to be honest. Um, I think it gets back to what we were talking about, some of the the envy and jealousy and the frustration, whether they see somebody else have a success. I'm still that way a little bit. You know, I'm a big elk hunter. Like this year was the first year in 22 years that I did not kill an elk with my bow. And I mean, I stayed after him the whole month of September. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't catch a break. I mean, I was like, I went to Oregon out out by... uh, Oh heck! It was that Starkey unit. Mm. Awesome elk hunting. It was yeah. good. Not not giant bulls, but a lot of them. And right. uh, I went to uh, I went out to Utah, 
um, and just had a tremendous amount of fun, but could not just, just, I had a couple shots at 80 and looking back, I should have shot. I just, but, <laughs> but it was one of those things like, I don't, I don't mind shooting there, but it's like, this bull's bugling. He's coming a little closer that, mm-hmm. that he's gone. But, um, but inevitably, you know, what am I doing? You know, I'm sitting there when I'm on the mountain looking at Instagram, seeing somebody kill a big elk, and I'm like, <laughs> you know, and so I'm on this like, where was this? Must yeah. be nice. You yeah. know, I, I wanted to put your, you know, the must be nice on there. Um, but inevitably, I, I think we somehow got to unify a little bit. And I think what we got to do, too, is is understand that what we love and our passion and our lanes, whether it's, uh, you know, like me, I love turkey hunting. I, I, I told you I got where I, I love uh, listen to the podcast you did with Newcomb about, uh, about uh, squirrel hunting and he was talking about bear hunting and stuff like that. That was interesting because I got where I love squirrel dogs, mm. love trapping. And so um, I love archery, but I also am not the guy that's going to sit there and say, well, you're a sissy if you ever pick up a gun mm. or you're this or that. It's almost like I would rather lead people to what I love through the love and, and desire of it. Um I think that can be said in fitness. It can be said with that in anything. You know, it's like if somebody sees you having positive energy, and if it is, you know, taking that rock up the mountain, sooner or later somebody's going to say, "Man, there's some sincerity in that." That mm-hmm. that gives him a, a certain vibe and meaning. Um, hunting does that. Uh, working out can do that. Um, you know, you know, y- your love of Christ can do that. There, there's so many things. Uh, your family. And I think sometimes the hunting industry cannot get out of the way of their own self, this mm-hmm. industry, because we're all trying to battle each other right? Or, or jump on a certain bandwagon. And in reality, how it wins is if we all just attack it this way. If, 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 if inevitably, if mm-hmm. I'm looking at this as a football team, I was like, wait a minute, Cameron Haynes, we can get Cameron. Okay. We got that covered. Mm-hmm. Waddell's up for draft. Okay. We got the cliches and the goofball sayings after he shoots something <laughs> he, you know he can definitely cut a few jokes in camp and then hey man we hear that you know blake shelton signed up he's working in the hunting industry well if you can't have fun with blake shelton you're probably <laughs> you know not breathing air uh, and then you start looking at it that way look at look at where we're reaching mm-hmm. and you unify that and so a lot of times people in my mind in the hunting industry we're trying to force feed or change legislative laws to say well you can't do this or you can't do that and i don't think that's the wrong approach i think we can win if we do a good job promoting what we love and whoever Mm -hmm. does the best job of it is going to take that you know element whether it's archery whether it's fitness whether it's a campfire and a good old cigar and a little glass of bourbon drinking an old-fashioned and telling stories about the family and weather it can go so many different directions and what you'll find is there's no area that's wrong right and, and I think that's where the industry goes wrong. They will see a certain vibe, and then they all try to jump on that vibe. Yeah. Let's just all live. We can live together. That's what I get excited about is to know, you know, when I'm over and my son was in college, and they're, they're kids that are over there hunting, and they're asking me about the hunting public guys and you. Mm-hmm. Well, it'd be easy to say, well, them guys, them guys man, I can out-hunt them boys. You know, I shoot. I, well, if I want to run up the hill, I could. <laughs> no, but I'm like, yeah. I know those guys, man. They're good. You're you're looking into some good people right there. You know, mm-hmm. and and uh, and and it makes me happy to say that because I know their lane. They they got to be doing something good in their lane. Yeah. And um, so I don't know. You're right, but it can definitely go for or it can go against us. And I think. I really feel like it's about 50 50 out there. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Maybe that's the cynicism in me, the old man again. But I feel like overall, when I get on it mm-hmm. and, and really dig deep, I, I'll get excited in some cases. And then I'll get really yeah. kind of like, why? What? Why did they do this? Right. You know, and I've even looked back on some of my posts like, man, I shouldn't have done that. That, yeah. that was that was immature. But Well, and, and I think some people are going to listen to this and say, oh, well, these guys are had the success so it's easy to say yeah celebrate others right i mean people yeah. people will discount whatever we say but the way i see it is it reminds me of this you know cam newton the other day was talking about the 49ers and he's taking a shot at brock purdy and saying he's like the 10th best player on that team and he might be i, I don't know what you're talking what are you talking about he's the right. best quarterback on that team 
So he's not trying to be the best linebacker. No, he's not. So yeah, there might be a, I mean, and the linemen aren't trying to be the best quarterback. So it's like, everybody's got their role, be your best, right? Right. So when you talked about that's how hunting can grow as you spread out, I look at it like a team. It's like, okay, if, if this guy's the best at this, he's going to go further. And together they'll all go further because they're accepting their role and they want to be the best at it. So don't try to be the next Michael Waddell. Correct. Try to be the best, whatever you do, and just own that lane. And then that's how we elevate each other. That's but correct. Everybody's just like, and I think what happens is sometimes people, they don't know what their strengths are. They don't know what they offer. So, because they're not sure of it, they want to bring other people down to make that gap closer, mm -hmm. right? Instead of trying to elevate themselves, they'll, they'll like... I don't know what I'm supposed to do, but this guy's having success. I don't like it. It doesn't make me feel good. I want Correct. to, I want to tear him down, but it just reminded me of the Cam Newton thing and taking a shot at Purdy because it's just like, yeah, let's just be the best at whatever we do. That's correct. Yeah. And, and I think, I think that sums it up. I think that is the definition of jealousy or envy, which are kind of somewhat two different things. And Cam Newton didn't realize it, but <laughs> he basically is pretty envious of where oh, for sure. Purdy is because I think that, I think by, I don't know. This is where we need Joe Rogan. He could he could correct me. Hopefully, he hears this and he can uh, correct correct me on this. But I think you know from what I understand, envy is where you know you don't like that person in that position. It bothers you that they're in that position. So I say something kind of envious to to take them down. In reality, you know, here Brock Purdy is playing in the biggest game in football, and uh, and he they got a real good chance of winning. Yeah, good team. Good amazing team. And so inevitably. That's a pretty immature, envious statement, even if it is true. And so uh, that happens a lot more in the hunting industry. And uh, and I think you're right, too. I think people just don't understand their own self-worth. And once they realize that um, and they can focus on that positivity of that versus feeling good about taking down somebody they're envious of or, or jealous of. Um, I mean, it, here's a reason. I remember... Uh, you know, you look you look through the Bible and the Ten Commandments, and one of them is thou shalt not covet. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, you know, there ain't no person on earth. You know, I've come from a Southern Baptist background, and everybody knows that, you know, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery. And as far as it goes, you know, like, but, <laughs> but they don't ever ones. think about thou shalt not have another false God before me, or thou shalt not covet thy neighbors. It's impossible not to. Yeah. How do you not, you know, get in a cool, you know, old Chevelle you know, with old 454 in it, crank it up. I'm like, man, I, I, I saw it during old General Lee Dukes of Hazard 69 Charger. Yeah. And I caught myself like, holy, holy cow, I'm breaking the Ten Commandments. I want this car. <laughs> I had the old Dixie horn. Do -do 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 I was wrong. I was like, man, I want this car so bad. I'm so mad at this guy. He got it and I don't. And so uh, inevitably, uh, yeah, you just have to learn. To, I think if you are going to be proud of something, you got to find some self-worth and be proud of yourself and what you can do. And that might not, it might not be anything that's, uh, worthy of crazy followers but uh to somebody it means a lot you know and i'm reminded and um you know one thing that touched me last night and and i don't i don't think it's talked enough about but uh man meeting your family uh all morning i i was i, I called my wife i called t-bone i said man i'm gonna tell you something man I, I met you know cameron's wife and hanging with his kid and you know, tanner and just chilling i said dude i felt like i was home in the south getting ready to eat a bowl of cheese grits and mm -hmm. you know eat some cornbread i said man we sat around and with the family and just chatted and talked about the weather to to politics to the state of the union and uh and uh and for me um it hit me because I, I was thinking about back home i got that seven-year-old boy man if i don't ever do nothing more man i'm at i'm at kids hero and we always yeah. we, we 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 got more people have people look up to them and they don't even realize it you know and so uh that's why, you know, for me, when I get a chance to even meet somebody or shake their hand, you know, especially we, we both the blessed get to go to some cool sports shows and mm -hmm. shake hands of people and meet hunters and look at trail cam pictures and, you know, probably in your case, looking at some achievement they made in yeah. a marathon or working out or, or maybe an elk they shot. And, and, uh, and I always think to myself, man, and, uh, when you meet a grown man, calloused hand man, just a hug and, Man, I call a little bro pants hugging like, man, what's up, buddy? Yeah. And then you get to talking and, and, and all of a sudden they got their daughter there and you hug the daughter and, and, you, and, and you don't realize the load that's on people. And yeah. it's so cool to just realize that, man, I just want to tell everybody, everybody's got so much incredible self-worth 
that some of these people that I get mad at that personally, sometimes I'm walking around ATA, like I'm going to find this dude. (laughs) There's been a few times like I'm going to go find this dude is talking crap, not just about me, but the whole, everybody that's successful. There's, There's might be a couple guys that's wanting to, and, uh, and then all of a sudden, I was like, man, I kind of feel sorry for them. They probably need a hug more than they need the yeah, ass whoop. But definitely. I kind of want to whoop the ass first and then, or at least t- attempt. I think yeah. we need to tread that. I think we need to tread it out. Let me be the shit talker. Yeah. And you come in with your crew because y'all, y'all can last longer. I got to get a sucker punch in. I don't know if I can go the long haul. But, uh, but in reality, I think they need a hug. Yeah. And, and, and somehow they need to know, like, bro, you ain't got to be hating on me. Yeah. You ain't got to be hating on Cameron. You ain't got to be hating on the hunting public or something that you saw on Outdoor Channel or the Bo Mars or whoever, you, you, you probably just need a hug. Mm-hmm. And let me tell you, your self-worth, yeah. you're incredible, but this that you're exuding does suck. Yeah, you know? I, it reminds me, I was, we were in Vegas one time, Rogan was there. And so anytime he's around, there's a crowd, right? I can't remember what we were drinking. This was years ago. It's like, uh, it was you know stupid. But anyway, there was tempers were flaring. Right. I don't know why. Circle bar. I don't know what it was. But everybody swole up. Everybody. And <laughs> somebody was acting tough around Joe. Yeah. And Joe was just like, he's like, come here, give me a hug. He gave the guy a hug. Are you serious? He recognized it. Gave him a hug. Oh, my God. That was it. I, I, dude, I've never met Joe. I want to so bad. I'm such a fan. And hearing stories like that, I've heard stuff like that. Mm-hmm. That's a that's a hell of a take for him to notice that. Yeah. Which Joe is a badass. I mean, he knows jujitsu. He could have choked a guy oh, in two point seven seconds. That, he, yeah, definitely. But he he knows to your point what men actually want or what they yeah. need, not what they want, what they need. They need to be. Hey, it's it. We're okay. Yeah. Don't worry about it. And um, that I could, I'll never forget that. But uh, that's big. It's yeah. Huge. I mean, it's uh. It's tough because what we do means so much to us. So it's sometimes yeah. it's hard to separate that emotion. Like when you it talk is. about the shows and this guy, and it, how it works is you never want to take for granted the positive, but you never forget the negative. You know what no, I mean? No, you don't. You don't. <laughs> no matter how much you try, like, okay, I got all this positive, but this one guy says this one is like, I'll never forget that guy. You know, I know it. And I don't know why that is. Do you ever feel bad, like scrolling through maybe your comments? Because mm-hmm. I do. I look at comments, you know, whether I'm looking at anybody's post, I'll go yeah. to comments and check on it, you know. Mm-hmm. And and, uh, and I'll be reading and you see and all the, and you're like, oh man, that's cool. Oh man, that's nice. And you're reading. Th- and then all of a sudden, like, what a douche. And you're like, wait a minute, who is, who is user 135, you know, freaking strong face American flag? Yeah. Who is this guy? You know, and it's like, yeah. how did I just scroll through 30? really good comments yeah. to land on this. It is amazing um, really how that works. And and there's a difference in true foul negativity than, and sarcasm. Like, um, you know, uh, my, my people that I respect the most, they'll think, you know, if they were to be on our text, you know, chain sometimes, I mean, yeah. it's a, it's yeah, a yeah. name called in and oh, it's, yeah. it's always a, you know, every time, like Jim Shockey, for instance, people like was at the shot show, and I had people at the Outdoor Channel booth getting worried about he and I. Like, man, I'm sorry. I said, no, 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 dude. But he's giving you bad just, time? Yeah, yeah, but it's it's kind of our relationship. Okay. It, it, it's it's kind of like, a, it's kind of like you know, three or four times if I saw you, you, you had a line and I'd do a push-up. Like, you know, it's my way of like, you know, <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. you know it's not a slide. It's right. like, what's up, what else? Shit. I'm like, hey, man. <laughs> you know, and, and, and yeah. sometimes a fan looks at me like, who is this asshole? Right. You know, what's he doing? You know, yeah. but it's, it, well, Jim's that way with me. He's like, mm. Booger, holler, have you learned a king's, queen's English yet? You know, and I'm, and we're just, uh, uh, yeah. uh, and then, and then it's just 10 minutes of that. And then it's like, Hey man, love you, buddy. I'll see you. Hey man, good luck. Hey, I saw Bramlin. You know what I mean? It's like, Hey, sorry, everything you're going through. And, but it's real, you know, Mm -hmm. if he sees something in my life that he thinks I'm being stupid about, he'll tell me and, you know, (laughs) and, and kind of vice versa. I can tell Jim, Jim that too. And so, uh, but on the surface, yeah, it's not negative. It's it's a sarcasm. It is those right. jabs. I mean, you know, fun. What, what would so? What would people like if you got mad at somebody's show? What were people upset at, with you about your success, or what would they say? What was what was hate you would get? You know, it, there's a story I'll tell, and I, I've told this a couple of times. I never forget the first year of Real Tree Road Trips. Th- this is kind of what I get a lot of. Well, one is 
you know, everybody say, well, it must be nice to kill them in a high fence. For yeah. the record, we've never, you know, shot an animal on our show on a high fence. We've never videoed in it. Nor, nor I, I haven't either. Nor has Cameron Haynes. I, go on, I could, matter of fact, I don't have any of my close friends that I know that, that do uh, video or put their content out in a uh, high fence. I, I mean, I know some that do. I know people that do, but we don't. Or yeah. Must be nice. It's a farm deer. Well, if I had a chance to hunt that, so yeah, that's the best quote ever. The <laughs> Rogan Haynes, uh, you know, must be nice to her. But um, I had, I never forget this, and it goes right in line with what we're saying. I, the first year of Real Tree Road Trips, first of all, I am so incredibly awkwardly insecure about having a line of grown men that would like for me to sign a hat. Everybody thinks that that's what they want. And I think there are certain people that probably would truly desire that, seek it out and be comfortable maybe in that moment. I wasn't because I couldn't understand it. Mm -hmm. I learned real quick, you know, it's hard for a man to come up and, and ask for an autograph because I've been on the other side of it to where be hanging out for five days, taking Dale Earnhardt turkey hunting we're laughing cutting up mm -hmm. and then i'm really the whole time wanting them to sign my camo hat and it's awkwardly <laughs> yeah like i don't i feel like it's going to make me look goofy or whatever mm -hmm. so anyway i learned right quick it's a disrespect if you like oh man you don't want my autograph you know you just sign it respectfully and, and go about your business so because it was I, a lot for them to ask for it it was a lot to yeah. ask for especially yeah. out of out of us men especially mm -hmm. sharing in the space i know these 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 men are not in line because they think I'm a better hunter. And it's not just you and them. There's a line of, there's people. Like there's people. They're humbling themselves to because they value you yeah. in front of other people. Not like they bumped in and said, oh, I'm a big fan. It's just like they have, there's an audience there. Exactly. Yeah. And so, and so, uh, I, you know, I, I've seen you handle crowds and you do it well, but it is a kind of a, a humbling awkward yeah, feeling right weird. and um so it was one of my first shows i'd went to it was in mississippi 2004 the show had aired in 2003 and uh we're at this big show at this mississippi hunting expo and there's a quite a few people in line and signing hats and stuff and there's a and you could drink beer to show people walk around there's some guys about my age they had two or three girls with them there's two or three of them well this old redneck come walking by and oh, who the hell are you and he, he's he's kind of He's kind of like making a little scene, about half titsby. And I'm like, oh, man, you know, I look and kind of laugh it off. Like, oh, man, no, no, nobody, you know, nobody. And yeah. and, then, and so all of a sudden he hangs around a little bit while they kind of say, well, I guess you some big damn star. And um, I'm like, God dang. <laughs> I didn't, and I definitely didn't know how to handle it. Right. You know, I, I was already kind of felt weird. Mm -hmm. So I was like, man, it was just my insides were kind of not mad. Just like, oh, man, this. Yeah, this uncomfortable. Guy knows, this guy really knows I ain't a star. I shouldn't be signing these hats. <laughs> he's and, calling me out. Yeah, he's calling me out. And so finally he kept on to the point where two or three people like, hey, man, shut up, dude. Leave Waddell alone. Mm -hmm. He finally comes back through. Same guy. Mouths off again. Man, who the hell are you? And at the time, I'm thinking, well, maybe he really don't. And, fi and I snap. I mean, I really snap. Like all of a sudden, I'm, I'm the kid in Manchester High School that, you know, I'm ready. I'm ready to party and got him out off his time to, I wouldn't say go over and fight. So I stopped and I said, I can tell you who the hell I am. Walked. I said, I said, I'm dude. If you'll go find your piece of shit bow, I'll walk out in the parking lot and show you how to shoot it and whoop your ass in front of your hot little girlfriend right here. And I said, I didn't hurt enough of your mouth. I said, I'm the guy. I said, won't you give me the key to your lease and I'll kill your damn turkeys. Won't kill mine. <laughs> Cameron swear. And I said it cause I was kind of sarcastically mad mm -hmm. to do it. What hell? What's up, baby? <laughs> Hug my neck. We traded phone numbers, and kind of hung out. And later that later that evening, I was by myself. I went and had a beer with the guys. Really? And it went from oh my god, similar to the Rogan hugging the guy. Yeah. He did know who I was, mm. but he had some whatever feelings about it, jealousy or envy. Yeah. But once he realized, he punched my button to basically see if I was like him, which I answered with saying, mm -hmm. bro, I am like you. Yeah, we're the I'm just, same. I can't believe I'm doing this, man. Right. I'm so scared of what I'm doing, but I know I can kill a turkey. Mm -hmm. I know I can shoot my bow and kill a deer. <laughs> and, you know, and I got confidence in myself. And once I showed him that, that I was like him, mm -hmm. man, we, we, were, we were like, it was a hug. And that's cool. Yeah. Hey, man, when, ain't you doing a seminar in a minute? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> all right, so we'll he, come back through. He knew all of it. Yeah. He knew it all. Yeah. 
Again, I'm sitting there the rest of the show. I'm like, oh my God, that was a deep dive in some psychology there. Yeah. I and so know in how reality, to that. That, that is most of the time, it's almost like maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe there's such a, it's hard for me to say because I can't gauge what it is people would even see in me, but maybe it's just that I'm so regular that what makes, what makes it special. Right. It's almost like, well, he ain't better yeah. than me. Right. I and, understand. And, and my answer is like, I'm not even trying to be better than you. I, right. You know, I, 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 I'll tell in the hunting industry, I was like, man, I ain't trying to out hunt nobody, but I'm out fun and trying to out fun everybody. Cause I like to have a good time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's not that I don't take hunting seriously. I take it really serious. And mm-hmm. I can look in my trophy room and know that, holy cow, man, I've had some success, but, uh, gets back to where we started earlier. My, my, my relationships that I've made and, and the things that we can talk about, these these old pictures that we got, you know, you and I, when we were, my yeah. God, looked like we're 10 years old. I know. I wanted to show this one. So it's like, <laughs> we can get this one on, on camera. Macy can make us a reel for it. But oh my yeah, goodness, look this at that. was 2004. And I don't know, I must have printed this out because again, I was like the, the biggest fan of, you were like, you, you were like what I wanted to be. That's you know? crazy. That's humbling, man. I, don't, so I didn't even realize that. I sent this to you, and then uh, you sent, you signed it and sent it back to Cameron. You're the man. Thanks for your friendship, Michael Waddell. UA photo shoot November 2004. So this wow. is 20 years ago. And, uh, yeah, I mean, we're a lot has changed in 20 years. What hasn't yeah. changed is how much we love to hunt, how much yep. we love what we do. So when you see you see people out there and it's hard not to say, are you doing this because you love this or mm-hmm. because you want to be, you don't want attention or you want to be a star or you want to be, a, get a sponsorship or things like this. So it's like, all I know is when I look at us, I know our intentions then were pure. We, yep. we, we just loved what we did and we couldn't believe how lucky we are. We were in, in PA 100%. doing a photo shoot for Under Armour. You were probably you were ahead of me as far as making it a career. You know, I just, I only quit my job like a year ago. So I, I still never, I, I had a hard time quitting that job because I thought I wasn't anything special and that was the best job I've ever had in my life. Who right. am I to quit a great job? Right. But I think it's that attitude that has helped us grow in yes. this industry. A hundred percent. As I was telling you, I had a conversation with some uh, old, uh, I call them old codgers, old trappers and hunters. It was asking me about you. And I said, man, you know what's funny is I said, uh, Cam and I are just alike and, and completely different. It's, just, it's, it's, it's amazing. But that is the same thing. I remember that particular photo shoot. Um, you're right. I mean, TV, outdoor television was big then. And we had had road trips. had just aired its first year. Um, you were writing and, and, and working, um, obviously, at the water company. And I remember me and you both was looking at each other like, what, what are we here for? Yeah. I'm like, God, they're going to, I bet they're going to let us have these shirts. <laughs> you know, <laughs> no. it's like, I think they're going to give us this whole box of camo. And we were like, uh, I don't know, man, like not at the Roxbury. Like, yeah. you know, we, we can't believe that Under Armour, you know, and, and two, I don't even think people realize Under Armour not only was getting in the hunting industry, Under Armour was maybe in Dick's Sporting Goods, yeah. you know, a Maryland based company. Yeah. They weren't anything of what they are now. And that was, I think, the first couple camouflage garments that they ever had and it was an under truly was an under yeah, wear that, that, that first you, layer first layer yeah. and uh so yeah I, I, th- that humbleness and that that excitement that student of the industry student of the hunt um I, I think that was us getting a chance to feel a little bit like you know chuck adams maybe or that miles keller even though we was being ourselves and so yeah that that pictures like that bring me back and and uh I don't know. It makes me feel really good. And it makes me feel really good getting back to success to see where you're sitting, the friends you made, the people you, you mix in with. And, and in reality, I, I think now as um, if I were to somewhat brag on you and I, it, it, it's cool because it's, it's I feel like we're really, truly have become ambassadors. There's mm-hmm. a difference. We're not just you know, yeah. little kids running around trying to kill an elk or have fun and meet up at the ATA and get some shrimp cocktail at St. Elmo's where now you look at what you're doing you, and who you've been able to talk to and see a picture in your Las Vegas at the UFC. Because what I see, a lot of people say, well, you know, get back to the jail saying, why is Cameron getting to be front row up there with Rogan yeah. and all those guys and Dana? And all? No, here's what I see. I see my buddy who's a bow hunter yeah. and I know what's in your heart and soul. It's bow hunting. I see me 
you know, people see Cameron. I see we're there. Yeah. We're there. If you see me over there hunting with Theo Vaughn, like we're taking Theo hunting. No. Because it's it, the same, man. It, it, we're getting a chance to influence our life and our culture of what meant to us or what we ate elk chili last night with your family. Yeah. Now we, even though it's you, sometimes me, we are getting to sell our culture. And yeah. so therefore there's no jealousy. Sometimes, uh, I take that back. Sometimes like, God dang, I wish <laughs> I was there having a cocktail with those guys. And yeah. that'd be fun to be that close to the fight and hang with them. I bet yeah. they're having good fun, but I'm seeing amazing. a culture represented mm-hmm. through you. And I hope people can see that through me. It's not about, I'm trying to out hunt, but I am trying to tell people that picture and where that started is still there. But now we're having a chance to bring so many people into it. And that's the beauty of what we get to do more than the animals. I think we get to shoot. I think so too. And like to that point, when I see you, it's like, I still see that, that hunting culture is number one. That's represented. That's who you are, you know, and I'm not trying to say I'm like that, but like on my Instagram page, I don't have New York times bestselling author, which was great. All I have, I don't have any, I have bow hunter. That's right. That's it. I don't, yeah, I wrote a book and it did good and it's cool that it made the list. Unbelievable. I'm, I don't yeah. care. I'm, I'm a bow hunter. That's what I care about. I'll always just be a bow hunter and that's enough. And so when you say yep. that because of our, our love for what we do, yes, I mean, I know you've been represented by Endeavor. You know, you've had yeah. like these huge opportunities, you know, friends with Blake Shell and worked with with hollywood type connection people but it's all just based on booger bottom georgia yeah to be honest and that still hasn't changed right yes i mean that's what to me is so beautiful about it because some people are might use these opportunities to get to this place and then they're like that was a that was another life when i was a bow hunter i'm doing this other stuff now no it's the same yeah matter of fact it's kind of crazy that's kind of where the success come from it's like what, what are you? Ah, oh, I'm Cameron Haynes, a guy that did this for so long that bow hunted, who, who, who enjoys fitness and pushing himself past what you think you can still push yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and then, and then chase down an elk from time to time and go hang with friends. Who am I? I'm still the snotty nosed kid. You know, now that beard has gotten gray that, uh, mm-hmm. from Booger Bottom who likes to call turkeys and have a good time. <laughs> and so reality once I feel like that's where, you know, and I think that's the whole thing we're trying to say if anybody's listening and wondering and when we own that when we truly own that but never left it mm-hmm. um that's where our success comes from right and i get it all the time too cameron people's like sometimes a booger bottom thing people get kind of frustrated with it and like man man why you gotta always say you from booger bottom i'm like i'm not i'm not telling you booger bottom to remind you where i'm from i'm reminding myself mm-hmm. i go home a lot and hang with my dad and you know, where I come from, which I had a great childhood, but Booger Bottom, it was dirt roads when I was a kid. It, it was, you know, a pop all lived next door, made moonshine liquor and uh, taught me how to garden, literally had a mule and my dad bought an old Dexter tractor, a little diesel. And man, my pop all loved that thing. And he died when I was 12, but I have so many fond memories of having a hog on a raised floor and he'd kill that thing on the first cold day. Um, Man, he'd have Fruit Loops sometimes, but he had goat milk in a refrigerator, <laughs> and it just sucked. And and so sometimes in my mind, if I'm in Las Vegas or I am somewhere in one of these cool places like you and I both have got a chance to be, and we're, you know, in a city, I always in the back of my mind, I'm thinking of Booger Bottom, not because I think I'm tougher or cooler to have some cliche area I'm from. It just reminds me that because I celebrated where I'm from and who I really am, it's got me to these opportunities in places just being who, me. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, uh, I, I think I'm more proud of that than, than anything because that ain't me. That that's culture. You represent something that's bigger than you and you just happen to be part of it. So, uh, yeah, that's, that to me is deep and super cool, man, for sure. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I don't think we, it, that can be lost on these people that might have similar goal. Maybe they see what we've done and they're like, I'd like to do something. It's like, never forget where you came from and it sounds so easy it's such a cliche but it's it's so powerful it's very powerful and that's what happens that's what detracts people from their from their journey that where they could have who knows where they'd be they get distracted on all this other stuff you know and and i've been distracted too sometimes you mentioned deals that weren't that great for alignment on your brand 
that does happen. Yeah, it's going to happen. But for the for you know 30 years been pretty focused on hey, this is who we are, this is what we do. Yep. And you can either join in or whatever. It's fine. That's it's great. not going to change. And uh yeah, I mean, I such good insight there from you. Um I did I this is kind of a funny story too, but you mentioned that guy who came up who's challenging you and he had his yeah. hot girl hot girlfriend there. So where on all the places you, where are the hottest girls at the sports show? Ooh, man, uh, <laughs> man, I, it, 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 is it the South? Are you, are you partial to the it, South? I think it's the South and, and probably Texas, man. Like you go down to, uh, have you been to Salt Lake? Salt Lake can, I, it I, produces. I, dude, to be honest with you, first of all, uh, my wife has skinned me up for saying this, but <laughs> I think these little country girls and these, uh, Th- these these ladies that do come out that are sincerely there sometimes just with their boyfriends or yeah. husbands but there's some beautiful you know women that come through these sports shows but yeah um it, it's really it's really all across the country yeah the south the south is hard to beat but it's funny i would say a lot of my western i'm not saying but, you notice now but no back i, I in don't the even day- know, i didn't even know a woman even visited the show anymore <laughs> right so i'm talking about years ago yeah. <laughs> I, all of my buddies from out west would come and work say the dixie deer classic Oh, they'll fall in love 17 times, but I don't know if it's just the looks or the Southern accents right. that really just it's get a tough them, combination. You know, and, uh, but, uh, but golly, man, I, 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 <laughs> this is so cool to talk about all this stuff because it's pretty, it's, it's deeper than what people think. And I, I think, you know, this whole thing is like when you know where you come from, people, cause, cause you're right. We had that in common too. I, I did carry a, a chip on my shoulder. I think, uh, you know, I was like, you know, as soon as I felt like if I was talking country and, and maybe I didn't understand. I remember being in meetings and people getting to talking about EVITA and, and and some high level margins and percentages. And we can do this. And I'd be like, you know, I'm, I'm over there with my little steeple, like trying to be <laughs> Mr. B. And I'm thinking, I don't know what in the holy hell they're talking about. I never forget one time I was in a meeting and a guy was talking. He said, well, you don't even know what we're talking about. He's kind of smug Uh-oh. to me. I said, do you know what a bull float is? And um. <laughs> He said, bull float, is that something to do with wildlife? And I said, well, you don't know every damn thing either. Concrete. Yeah, concrete, exactly. (laughs) And I said, I don't trust man not what a bull float is. I might not know what even it is. And these margins you're talking about, because it used to be a joke in industry. Every deal I had, I wanted 10%. Mm. And the reason is because 10% was an easy mathematical equation. (laughs) You know, and I'd be talking like, we can't do 10% Waddell. We're talking about these things are going to be, you know, $2,000 a piece. And like, yeah. Okay, two hundred dollars. You know, yeah. you know, it's like no. What else? This has got to be like one point seven percent, or right. you know, two point two is best we can do. And I'm like, that's tough to figure out. I don't know if I can figure that. I ain't hired an accountant yet, you know. <laughs> so inevitably, I did carry a chip, and I was, and, and so I, I. But but you don't leave it. That's why some of these people, if you're from the, you can be from the hood, or you can mm-hmm. say, man, we we didn't have this, have that. Use it to your advantage. Right. Why be a victim of it? Use it to to push you forward, and and I don't think there's nothing that holds anybody back. I think it's people, you know. Some of the people you have on this podcast are such prime examples about it. Uh, from these ex Navy SEALs, I heard the podcast with Dakota Meyer, and and uh, I mean, just there's so many crazy stories of not allowing themselves to become a victim right. and uh, just push through. That's the key. And sometimes the obstacles are so insane. Um, I mean, just for where, where we're at in the hunting industry, I don't people realize it, it, it was a blessing. I think some things were just, man, we, we had a very blessed opportunity. Um, but nobody can't say we worked hard. Right. Man, it, it didn't. Yeah, we're here now. It just happened. We're in our 50s. I think we're in our, I, I don't want to say we found peace because I don't want to think we're satisfied. We're still striding forward. But there is a different dynamic of, yeah. of, a, of, a, of a vibe that feels good. Definitely. You know, definitely. Uh, you know a cup of coffee is better. A glass of wine in the evening or a cup of bourbon tastes a little sweeter. But it wouldn't if I'd have left something on the table. Mm-hmm. Now I'm trying to figure out, all right, if you stay the same, you get worse. You got to get better or you get worse. You know, right. we're, we're talking about how to improve and what we do. And so the journey ain't over, but you find peace. But... It did come with a lot of hard work and dedication, literally being broke, uh, literally like I look at that picture. I can promise you right now, me and Cameron Haynes didn't have a pot to piss in right there. Mm-hmm. We were just trying to. But, we, but, but I, you know, we were probably just as happy there as we were now. I mean, because we saw the journey ahead and we were just happy to get a hungry, couple, hungry, a couple free hungry. Under, under, armor, under Armour shirts. And I think yeah. at that time Hoyt was 
sending us a bow a year. Yeah. And I'd look and, man, you know you love bow hunting when you'd go sit on the damn toilet with it. And don't <laughs> act like y'all, somebody's listening to where they went. You're like, you're sitting and you're like, I am taking a shit looking at my bow. What am I doing? <laughs> and especially when Hoyt has sent you one. Yeah. I'm like, this is crazy. Yeah. This is insane. And so, uh, I don't know, man. Good memories, man. What a hell of a ride. What I like about it is, uh, you know, because of the industry, how it works, I've been at different brands with people and maybe they didn't get the attention they thought they, they deserved. So they want to leave that brand. You know what I mean? Yep. And to me, what I like is like, we've, we've both been with Hoyt for so long yeah. and, it, and it wasn't like, I've never looked at like, why are you doing this with Bone Collector? You're not doing this with, with me. But Correct. that happens in the industry a lot. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, at Under Armour that happened. At, you know, it's just happened. And it's just, it's so hard. And I, and I can't really talk sh too much shit because that's competitive. But it's like that turns into a detriment also. He does. And uh, so what I feel good about is that we've, could be competitive. That's fine. Yeah. And I could see what you do. And it's like, God, I need to work harder if I want those type of opportunities. That's how I looked at what right. you did. Um, so I like that it's been healthy in that regard. Um, but it is, it's like, you know, I was telling you yesterday when I was coming up back then and before, when I first started bowing, I didn't even know people paid off houses. I didn't know if I, <laughs> I thought you just always had a car payment. Yeah. You know, I'm just, I'm like, I never thought that I would ever have anything really other than bow hunting and maybe a free bow. <laughs> exactly. And so when I, when I hear about you and you have your, your, I mean, five, do you have 500 acres? Yeah. I got about 550 acres. My wife and I bought at 15. Yeah. I mean, how from, you know, from doing what we love has led to those opportunities. I mean, did you ever think that would happen? No, I'd always dreamed of it. I dreamed of it, but mm -hmm. man, I mean, Think of the things we have dreamed of that that are still we're thinking of. So for me, um, I almost felt oddly weird and guilty, like for, for having a chance to to buy something or get something at that level. Mm -hmm. Like uh, I was talking to, uh, you know, again, a little bit of a name drop, but Blake Shelton, same way, built a beautiful place. He's put together in a fantastic piece of property in Oklahoma. Hmm. He and Gwen built this beautiful house. I mean, it's, it's, it's an Eblis, a mansion. And he, he just like, he was showing it to me and uh, Jimmy John was mm -hmm. there, the sandwich guy. And Jimmy is such a nice guy, but he can own his wealth. He's yeah. like, Oh man, what is this? So-and-so Marvin, did you get this in Italy? You know, and he's, you know, and Jimmy, Jimmy <laughs> he's more just, comfortable with he's it. He's very comfortable. Yeah. Blake was so uh, awkwardly uncomfortable like, I don't need this, but I mean, how much money has he made? You know what I mean? And so for me, I, I, I took the same kind of stance. Like, you know, I, I'm, I'm a little embarrassed, even though there's people that's got thousands and thousands of acres. But for me to think about owning, you know, over 500 acres in Georgia mm -hmm. that I got food plots on and I got me a nice tractor that I can plow and I got me a pecan farm and my wife and I just built our dream house, and I got a cool barn down there with guest quarters. If you want to come down there and bring the family, bring Tanner down. I was so aggravated to find out Tanner went through Fort Benning. He could have, <laughs> he could have threw a rock to Uncle Waddy's house, and I could have, I'd have made it tougher on PT with him. He'd be eating that fried chicken and cornbread down at my place. But um, I, I'm almost, I'm very proud of it, but mm -hmm. but I'm also kind of guarded. Like, man, I don't, I don't want to show off on it or feel right. like I don't know. It feels, we it feels weird for me, but I think that comes from that humility of dreaming. But then realizing, like, oh, my God, I got it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, dr I mean, dream come true inevitably. Or to go it's, on the hunts we go on sometimes, it's crazy. But it's also, it's like, could, should you shy away? I understand yeah. that um, because it is the American dream. Yeah. I mean, didn't you come, when you came out of high school, you got, what, uh, HVAC? Or yeah. What, right? yeah, HVAC, heating and air. Yeah, yeah so, heating and air degree. And I remember, uh, I think I listened to a podcast and you said you had your own van, had your name on yep. it, and your family was like, why would you quit this, you yeah. know? And so it's not like this just happened. No. And all of a sudden you had, oh, must be nice. He's got this 500 acres, this awesome house, and, you know, this, er, everything going his way. That whole journey, like that decision to not take the HVAC job or not take pursue that career, but to go... At Realtree and make 20,000 bucks a year or whatever it was. That's where, how, that's how you got to where you're at now. Correct. So that tough de decision, how many people would have went done that same thing? 
I, I think that's the same for, for you and I both story. That's what this picture represents. If you look at that picture, both of us in our 20s, photo shoot for Under Armour, 2004. I almost break things almost in percentages. I've always looked at life, and, and I luckily looked at it then, and I don't know if you looked at it this way, but, um, you know, out of 100%, obviously, that's that's, that's what it is. If, if, if you got a 15 or 20% chance of making it in something, whether, say, I want to be a country singer, whether, say, I want to be an influencer, YouTube star, uh, you know, on Outdoor Channel, whatever it might be, um, an actor, uh, you know, comedian, you always have that percentage that you can make it in that, but you understand the odds are going to be against you because there's 20% of people, maybe less, maybe Mm -hmm. 5%. I mean, we were talking last night when you get into that category of say what Joe is doing right now, Tucker Carlson, that's up there in a probably one percentile, two percentile of people and influence. All right. Probably less, probably less than that. And so in reality, but let's just say making it in country music. Okay. So you got a 10%, 15% chance of making it. Maybe it's less. Mm -hmm. My idea was like, well, then that leaves me a 90% chance to make it in something else. Mm -hmm. Why not go after the 10% now? You and I did when we were young in our Mm twenties, it's almost like, why not go after it now? And I've already, thank God, already somewhat, I wouldn't say I had that Goggins mindset yeah, or, or kind of what you preach and just work harder. Uh, I don't know if I had that mindset, but inevitably I had something in me that said, well, I better do it now. I got an HVAC, Bill Jordan, Realtree's making money. They need a cameraman. They need a guy. They need somebody to help hang these stands. Dale Earnhardt wants to hunt with a good turkey collar. Man, I'm pretty good turkey collar. Might as well hunt with me. <laughs> yeah. And so I started looking. I started chipping away. I was like, wait a minute. Now, now I went from a 10% chance to where in the door, now I might have a 40% chance Mm -hmm. to all of a sudden, here we are, you made it. Right. And I always say, somebody's got to be Prince. Somebody's got to play a guitar. Not that like we were talking about, you need to emulate and be Prince, but somebody had to be Prince. Mm -hmm. Somebody's got to be the next basketball player uh, that's, that's great. And even though there's a lot of them, so... If you look at it, we all have equal opportunity if we understand our abilities and talents, I think. And then even if you want to try something, like, for instance, I use this as an example. I I love outdoor motocross. Love it. Like, keep up with those guys. Met some of those motocross guys. They're they're my heroes. I think they're some of the best athletes. So what do I do when I'm 40? Made enough money and went and bought me a 450. Bought all my kids. (laughs) I built a freaking motocross track that you could race outdoor nationals on. <laughs> well, what did I do? I can't even hardly draw my bro- bow. I'm breaking my back and busted up, breaking <laughs> ribs because I'm still 12 years old, but I'm a 40 something year old man out here yeah. trying to race this 450 dirt bike. I suck. My goal was I want to race, a f- I want to run a few races oh. and, and try to win like a little amateur thing. Well, I got in a few and I got sack at one. And then the next moto, I freaking just crush kill myself so my <laughs> wife is like no sympathy like this is the last time we do it so it hit me i'm like okay i've gotten way out of my lane <laughs> and so i realized i have zero chance probably of even winning just the over 40 division right yeah so it, so but i'm glad i did it yeah and so yeah. it could be Took somebody that, that wants to try stand-up comedian or, or mm-hmm. maybe they want to you know start bow hunting or whatever and so uh I don't know, man. I, I I think I think in that that that's been the coolest cool thing to see that picture is because that was a lot of journey ahead, and me and you put some dice on the table right there, baby. Yeah. I mean, we rolled them, mm-hmm. we rolled them, and uh, and so to have that opportunity uh, is pretty crazy. And my family did not understand it, Cameron. Not my grandmama. I mean, they it was so blue collar and so um, basic American get you a good job, get good health benefits. Um, what can the company give you? Man, 401k. They have a gr- 401k. Yeah. Great Christmas party, man. You could get a free turkey every year. They give, they give free turkeys out down there or ham. You can pick a turkey or ham for Christmas. Wow. Yeah. For it, free. For free. You know, or <laughs> Hey, and, and if you work there, if you're there for six months, you get two vacation days mm. and y'all know y'all like to go down Gulf of Mexico and go to Edgewater and, Go play in the sand. Like, that's going to be big to your family. And so I, I bought into it. Yeah. But then I was also thinking, is there more than this? So I think what happens in people's depression or aggravation, 
uh, especially when they get our age, they're mad they went that route. Right. They and took it, the safe and, route. And I, and, and I thought in my mind, like, I, I could be screwing up. My mm. uncle might be right. I, I might be, man, that uniform says Michael on it. And yeah. Barringer's eating and cooling. I'm pretty good at fixing these air conditioners. <laughs> and he told me he's going to give me a raise next year and give me, you know, if I sold brand new train, you know, heat pumps, he'd, he'd give me, you know, 2% on all of them and I can make a, Five hundred dollars extra if I sold them this particular sear unit, and and I am not knocking anybody. Matter of fact, those every those everyday hardworking guys are my heroes. But if you get to a place where you think it's too late, you can actually get bit more bitter and aggravation. Yeah, uh, I think that's where most that the online hate comes from. Yeah. It's like the guys who didn't make that decision. Yeah, that tough decision. Like, should I take the the van with my name on it, or should I chase this dream? And then they get down the road and it's too late. And then yeah. they're just, then they're bitter. Yeah. And they feel like they're just jealous that of where you're at now, not the journey you did. Cause nobody yeah. wants to, all the, you talked about the challenges, the failed marriage, the the missing your kids and not making the money. Nobody wants to talk about that. They just see where you're at right now. That's correct. And that's, you know, I mean, I think it's human nature in some ways, but yeah. <laughs> God, it's so cool and so deep, man. I, I I figured, you know, when we got a chance to talk, because I didn't, uh, you know, when, I, when when you invited me up, which I was honored to be part of this podcast, I, I, you know, I didn't know which all direction it would take because there's so many roads. But it is crazy uh, about the timing and, and how, how we had our opportunity to work in this space, mm -hmm. uh, you know, culturally and everything that's transpired. And it's, uh, I don't know, it's been pretty, it's been pretty wild, but I, I will say that's, that does what makes America great. And, yeah. and it's caused me where I'm at. It's caused me to kind of have, I might not be saying this right, less empathy for people and complainers um, because I realize how hard I have worked, but I realize that they're spending so much energy mad at the people that succeeded when I see something in them that they don't see in themselves. So it's not that I'm mad that they're being negative. I'm mad that it's like, did you not look in the mirror? Mm -hmm. Are you just looking at social media and seeing this person? Did you not look at your ability and talents? And if you did and you can't admit that you were talented, why did you not take the gamble? Right. You'll sit here in Vegas and put $100 on a blackjack hand, but you wouldn't put damn 10 bucks on yourself. Right. So why are you mad at me? Yeah. There is a part of confidence, not arrogance. If you can't bet on yourself, who the hell are you going to bet on? I've always thought, I told him, I saw a... You know, you go out in Vegas and give them that card. I was at the Venetian Pit Boss. Pit, that's what I'm thinking of. And I'm playing blackjack. And I, I enjoy blackjack. It's fun. <laughs> you know, I, I, and I'm not a big gambler, but I enjoy the game. And I like getting me a little cocktail. And, you know, it's one place you can have your cigar and sit there at the table and laugh and cut up. And I can meet. I, I like to bullshit and tell stories. Yeah. So I can sit around. And it's just I'm laughing, cutting up. And I'll, I'll figure out what I want to lose. If I lose it, I lose it. If I win, it's a happy day, and I'm just talking more trash at the table, you know. <laughs> and I told that pit boss, I said, y'all got this wrong. I said, we betting on a hand that we don't know nothing about. We playing a game mm -hmm. and wondering and hoping we get that paint card or get a ace, hoping she bust or whatever. I said, if you really want to make some money on us men, I said, give us a chance to bet on ourselves. You ought to have a hoop swinging and throw a football through the hoop. Have a ring to bail where you can put $20 double or nothing. Can you Can you imagine me and you? <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I don't lift a lot, but can you imagine me and you and Joe Rogan and your buddy Dana White walking up to a ring the bell in Vegas and it's $100 to ring yeah. the bell? Mm -hmm. Cameron, we would all die. Yeah, trying. If we couldn't. Yeah. Can you imagine how many times we would like, cause when it's not a gamble, right? We're used to betting on ourselves yeah. and, and then, and then it would get in like, Cameron, <laughs> I got a hundred dollars on you. Damn it, man. Yeah. You come know, on. I ain't been lifting. I've been eating cornbread and macaroni and cheese. Damn, <laughs> come on. And next thing you know, we would be broke because we're betting on ourselves. Right. Because that's the kind of personality yeah. we are. Some of my buddies would never bet on themselves, man. Right. They never and, would. You know, I, I say that too. I say, I know you probably have also, but if I've made it, anybody can. And it's, yeah. you know, if you went to where I grew up, it's, there's no big dreams out there. Right. You know, is it 24 kids in my high school class, a hundred in the whole school, people just worked in the woods or, or in the mill. That's just what, there was nobody with these big dreams. So if, if I can come from there, from there, you can come from Booger Bottom and be the, you know, the most famous hunting TV celebrity there's ever been. Anybody can. 
Anybody but can. Yeah. You have to believe in yourself. You have you to believe. believe. And you not only that, but you have to be tunnel vision focused and work because you've worked mm -hmm. your ass off. Yeah. You know, and like you say, you're not good with numbers or whatever. You're a definite visionary because you had a vision for this brand and this brand, your brand has, has, is iconic. Right. So yeah, that you can talk like the simple country talk, but God dang, you had a vision. Yes, I, I will. I will say that. And th yeah. thanks for even saying that. And it's flattering those comments or compliments you give me, but it's a, uh, it's crazy because as crazy and, and visionary as you have, inevitably it, it, it becomes this, this this simple conception of of just kind of stay focused and work. Mm -hmm. And like we said earlier in the talk, uh, there, there's things that fall behind because you're focused here. You're like, wait a minute, uh, Mason, I ain't been to his ball game. Mm -hmm. You know where. Um, and now I think I'm more conscious of that. You know, now I got a seven year old at home. Um, you know, being through not being a great husband is easier for me to really be a good husband to Christy. And um, I mean, I, I still fail. I'm still mm. a dude. I'm still that man child that, that <laughs> that's, I'm sure she loves and hates because I'm still a kid. I mean, we, you know, I'm sure if I hung out with you know me and you, all of a sudden we'd be like step brothers around here. Yeah. Next thing you know, we're running in making a mess and. Your wife had had to get on to you and I equally like, take your boots off, Cameron. Take yeah. your boots off. Michael. I'm sorry. You know, we're, we're going over to the bow rack. You know, he gave us some new scent stuff, you know. Yeah. And, um, but inevitably, uh, I don't know, man. It's such, it's such an amazing life. is such an amazing thing. And, uh, again, to, your mistakes and, and, and regrets almost – are blessings too. It's, mm -hmm. it's almost like I, I'm I'm thankful for it because all that makes you better. You know what's there's so many crazy sayings and cliches, but you know I, I've heard it on so many podcasts. People talk about well, you you wouldn't know what a what a good meal was if you were never hungry, right? You know, you yeah, would, you would never know how good a soft bed is and warm sheets and blankets if you had never been cold right. or slept on rock and. uh and I think that's it. I think I see a lot of that in what you guys do and a lot of your guests and friends that, you know, why would you tote a rock up the mountain? Mm -hmm. Man, sure, you're going to make it nice that night to sleep. Every <laughs> night. It's like yeah. I'm exhausted, you know. I, I get out there and work with my dad, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I ain't running with a rock up the mountain, but I, I, every time I go out there and work with my dad, you know, he's about, about to be 71 and, Man, he's the hardest working man. We'll go cut firewood hmm. on my place. I'm like, Dad, look now, you my daddy, but we're on my farm and I'm about to go back to the house because I'm tired <laughs> of splitting wood and cutting wood on yeah. my place. And like, well, boy, we're going to start something. We're going to start it. We're going to finish it. No, we're going to get another load. And I'm like, Dad, it's my place. <laughs> I'm over here arguing with my dad like yeah. a little kid on my farm, you know, and just exhausted. But at the end of that night, man, you have yeah, a glass of sweet good. tea and you're like, man, it felt good. And so, the pain is worth it because mm -hmm. that's how you can feel uh, the comforts. And, and I think that's not to get political or, or where America's at, but I think the only people want the soft right now. A lot right. of people, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's true. A, it's uh, so where did your competitive drive come from to, to win or to, to chase your, where did that, where'd that come from? Have you always been like that? I would say over, overall, um, I think what changed a lot for me that made it, uh, that made me, uh, I felt like there was two sides. So, so when, when I was young, I was always in sports and stuff and mm -hmm. loved it. But when I was 16, my, my mom uh, got sick of leukemia and she passed away. And so then it become uh, kind of my dad and I, and, and, uh, and we had adopted a foster uh, sister that was adopted when my mom was still alive. And then she unexpectedly just got sick and passed away. And I think I was angry. So uh, it was a little bit of a kind of a Ray Lewis rage in me to where uh, on the inside, you know, when I went to football practice, it turned into a little different. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, was, I was always not that guy that wanted to really just murder somebody on the football field. I was competitive on the win, but all of a sudden then I started taking things a little more personal. I was kind of mad and frustrated and like, you know, almost, almost li like yeah. life has dealt you an yeah. unfair hand. Like, like, come on, mm -hmm. you know, even like questioning, like, God, why, why did you take my mom? She was an amazing person. We had seven foster kids in our house. She, you know, I was a mama's boy. I mean, she cooked three meals a day, homemade biscuits, mashed potatoes, collard greens, fried chicken. I mean, your typical Southern family. And all of a sudden it's just 
me and dad. My dad's got a ninth grade education. And so I think most of that competitive drive come with a little bit of frustration and chip on my shoulder, but hiding behind, you know, just a lot of fun storytelling and good, Mm -hmm. but that was sincere. So both sides of that was sincere. And, uh, and two, it's like, you know, I, I've, I've lost so much and I realize it's just funner to win. Mm-hmm. I don't like participation awards. Uh, so the, the people that would cr- like be jealous of where you're at, do you think they're they're thinking about the, the six, 16 year old Michael Adele who lost his mom? You know, yeah. and, and like the yeah. reason why you you have that success or you're so driven is because you've been in the depths of despair because you yeah. hurt so bad and you don't want to hurt that bad anymore. So how can you take away this pain? You can win. Win. And, 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 it, and I remember I got in a competition turkey calling and that's, that's what kind of launched into me kind of meeting people in the industry. And I had a couple people in my high school. Um, I started turkey calling, got pretty good. And we, all of us old country kids, we went turkey hunting and all we had in Georgia was deer and turkey, squirrel and rabbit. You know, mm-hmm. we used to have a lot of quail, but we don't have that as much anymore. And um, so when turkey got kind of real popular, we, we'd do that a lot. And I got really into it. And I remember uh, my mom had passed away. And and so back then, you know, in the country, we had TV and you had the antenna. So we we, we had super, we could watch the Braves and we had like ABC, NBC, uh, didn't have any of the HBO and cable stuff like that. My dad had bought a VHS player so we could watch that. But it wasn't like... Uh, there was a bunch of console games to play. Of course, I'm 16, so I really don't want to sit there and play video games um, anyway. And so to occupy my time, I hunted a lot more. And then um, and then I got into turkey calling. Mm. And, uh, you know, nobody had cell phones, so you sit around the house, and I'd buy condoms from the store in these little old bathrooms and cut mm-hmm. them up and make, make turkey calls with them. And uh, matter of fact, I told a story the other day, I ended up getting – uh, high, I think it was third place in the world championship with a glow in the dark condom <laughs> turkey call I really? made. And, um, but I remember before I started turkey calling, I remember I told a couple of my buddies that I turkey hunted with, getting back to kind of this weird mm-hmm. uh, jealousy or doubt, uh, but it pushed me to do it, but it scared me. I told some of my buddies, I said, man, I think I'm going to go get in the Georgia State turkey calling contest. It's the first contest coming up. And they're like, are you crazy? Mm-hmm. Joe Drake and Ricky Joe Bishop are coming there. That, you know, Dick Kirby still comes and calls an Appalachian Open. And, dude, you're going to be embarrassed. They're going to kick your ass. And, and and the whole time they're saying it, I'm thinking, they're right. They're right. They're right. Then the other part of me is like, no, they're not right. Mm-hmm. I, can, I think I'm good enough to compete with them guys. But I'm like, no. So it's almost like the devil and the angel yeah. story. And I went. I went anyway. Mm-hmm. But I mainly went more because they told me I was going to suck. Mm-hmm. It was weird. And these are my buddies. Want to prove them wrong. Yeah. It, it, I mean, they, they weren't trying to be mean. Right. It was almost like, uh, I don't know what to like it to. Maybe maybe if it's you running and all of a sudden it's like, man, I've been, I'm in my 40s gotten pretty fast. And, mm-hmm. and you tell me, hey, man, I'm uh, about to have a foot race with old Cam Newton. I'm like, Cameron, <laughs> you can beat him distance, but don't don't race that guy on a forty, right. man. Don't don't do that. You know what I mean? I, I don't know. You might would smoke him. I don't know, but it, it, it was almost said in that nature. But right. I'm like, wait a minute. Mm-hmm. Kind of immediately when I say that to you, you think, well, shit, I, I, Cameron Newton. I still got, I still got, I, a little. I still got a step. Don't <laughs> don't make me run a little bit more. Yeah. So that's kind of what it was to me. So a lot of it come from that, and I think that's either in you or it's not. And um, and I know I, I enjoy being around. Uh, kids and and watch them play baseball and football and it's cool to see that spark and fire mm-hmm. and it changes though it does change for me um, prior to my mom I was a pretty good football player but I come a lot better because I went to practice a little bit more I'd say angry mm-hmm. you know and and it's funny that's when I realized too the psychology of a of a good coach because mm-hmm. you know? I remember uh, th- that was the first time to my mom had never seen me p- play and start on the varsity team. And she loved, she always said that, you know, you're going to play Manchester football, which is a high school I went yeah. to. And then you're going to play with the Georgia Bulldogs and play with Atlanta Falcons. I mean, she never even knew about the hunting industry. And, um, well, she never even got to see me play varsity football at Manchester. So mm. when I got to start, I remember, uh, my football coach every time, if he wanted to piss me off, if I would be slacking, he's like, you think that's making your mama proud, boy? And I would want to murder. I mean, I wanted to 
Yeah. But every time I'd just go yeah. run out there and just hit anybody. Yeah. I'd run over the cheerleader. Like, he, I'm going to hurt somebody this next play. This guy talked. Because he, he, he would remind me. He, yeah. he, he punched that button. Mm-hmm. And uh, and he knew he knew that that was something. He knew it put yeah. a chip on me. So uh, I think that's it. How, how about for you? I mean, it's similar. Kind of that same, the doubters. What uh, you? Yeah. Doubters for sure. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, I was going to say, though, with your mom, uh, how long was that hard for? Like, you know, a mom is at that age. I don't know. I can't imagine what that would be like. You know, I lost my dad, but it was when I was 40. Right. As a 16 year old, when you when she had that presence on your house with the foster kids and the, and the cooking and to take that away. I mean, I can't imagine that pain. How long was that? Did it, that? It, you know, to be honest, I, I don't know. Cause I was a mama's boy, man. I don't know that I ever got over it. You you get over it in a way that becomes a positive, mm-hmm. never forget kind of thing. Um, uh, I heard Billy Bob Thornton talking about that and losing his brother. Um, it it was, man, probably the saddest thing I experienced. And I at that time, you know, I'd uh, I'd lost my grandparents, which I was really close when I was twelve, and. And uh, it's crazy. It's almost like a lot of folks I really cared a lot about passed away when I was young. And then my mom at 16 was almost like just mm-hmm. sucker punch. And, you know, and to me, she was just an angel on earth. And um, so, yeah, it, it, it changed the whole culture of our home because it was very simple. My dad made the money. My mom was a homemaker. And I don't care if it was seven families coming to our house. Mama was, come on in. And it was always food. I don't mm-hmm. know how she did it. And uh, just just an amazing lady, and so uh, what was her name? Her name was Susie, mm. and uh, and so uh, it, I, I think I mean everything I do, um, I feel like she's kind of still there. And as, here's a here's a here's a you talking about an odd story that relates to like a divine type of vibe. I remember kid, I was uh, hunting in the Gila National Forest for elk. I put this in the book, and uh, but I had never told it on a on a podcast, but. Uh, I never forget. I had been road trips was doing well, and it was this really nice bull, about a 315, 20 inch bull, on this public ground in the Gila, and there was a lot of hunters in there. I kept running. I, I, it was the first time I had elk hunted. I'd always seen trucks, but I was hearing callers around me. It was almost like a turkey hunt. I could hear mm-hmm. like, "Oh my God, who was it? That's somebody!" Like, well, man, we in here with other bow hunters. So anyway, we finally get this bull working. I was hunting with a buddy of mine, and this bull come up through there about 40 yards and he was a little quarter to me and I shot him felt like I put a really good shot on him well we tracked him a lot of blood and couldn't find him and I said man I had to just get one lung you know so then I was frustrated because now I'm like dead gummit and so we had looked and got and Nick Monk was in camp he was hunting so uh they they met up and we tracked a little while so finally it gets to be about one o'clock and uh we ain't got we ain't we ain't hardly got nothing in our packs, you know, we had to add some water. And so, uh, my buddy of mine, he said, man, we're going to get back to the camp and eat us something. And why don't we come back and let's refresh and we'll come back and look for this bull this afternoon and do the weirdest thing. I'm sitting there and the last blood we had on this bull was about three quarter mile up this ridge. We just fell off the next valley and maneuvered our way down the valley back to the truck, to, mm-hmm. to the rig. And I said, Hey man, I'm just going to stay right here. I got a little old, uh, candy bar in my pack. I'll make this candy bar. I'm going to sit here and take me a nap because y'all only going to be gone an hour or two and y'all going to come back. Mm-hmm. And dude, I'm sitting there under this tree. I'm trying to take a nap, ate my ha- candy bar. And for some reason, I just started having this conversation with my mama. I'm like, mama, dead gum you see. You know, I don't know. I was just talking to her like she was there. And 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 uh, literally almost, if, if somebody had a camera on me or slipped up on me, they thought I was crazy. I was mm-hmm. over there talking to mom, I mean, I'm not getting a response. I'm like, dang, mom, it's been crazy. Man, help me find this bull. Son of a gun, did you see where it go? And it was almost like a a weird something out of a, a movie. And um, so anyway, I'm getting anxious. I'm like, man, I said, and I'm thinking to myself, like, I hit that bull pretty good. And just like we do a thousand times, you know, I had an old flip phone at the time. Mm-hmm. And I'm videoed with that flip, but it was terrible. It wasn't like our iPod. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I couldn't say, oh, man, look, like I hit him good. And, so I'm sitting there and I'm like, I'm sitting there and I'm like, Mama, you got to help me find this bull. And so finally, um, I kind of get up, start kicking rocks, and I'm just kind of walking circles. And this, I'm wanting to walk up the hill and start looking again. I'm like, no, wait another 45 minutes. Mm-hmm. My buddies will be here. 
I'm not a good blood tracker anyway. I'm red, green, colorblind, terrible blood tracker. So I start walking kind of back down the ridge, and I and I knew that there was a water tank down there, uh, and I was going to go see if there was any sign on it because a couple of buddies in camp still had uh, tags. I go walking down there where I look, and there's a truck parked down mm-hmm. there. And I said, oh, man. And I'd just been telling, talking kind of to my mom, and I said, man, you know what? I, I looked in my pack, and I had a little old uh, envelope where I had a license and I had a pen where I'd, you could sign a tag. So I started writing a note like, hey, this is my number. My name is Michael. Hit a bull. If you guys are hunting in the area, mm-hmm. uh, just let you know if you find a six by six and he shot on the you know, the right side <laughs> yeah. with a muzzy broadhead in him, it's, it's my bull. And uh, so in my mind, I'm saying, I'm going to go down there. So I got back kind of, and luckily I brought my bow. Why I brought my bow, I don't know. And I'm only about 300 yards from where I was laying on this pine tree. And I'm walking. I said, Mama, that gum, I'm going to leave this guy. I said, man, this, this bull's got to be here. By the time I look out behind this dude's truck, like his truck is parked here, I look and this elk walks out from behind the truck. And it's a it's a six by six. Hmm. And I grab my binoculars and I look and I said, God, that looks like my bull. And I'm like, it can't be my bull because my bull was up the ridge up here. Why would that bull come way down here? He would have had to do a loop. So my mind, for some reason, and some game warden or somebody's going to say, well, this was unethical, I literally thought, that's my bull. But in the back of my mind, I'm like, I can't be sure. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't tell. It was on the opposite side of where I'd shot him. So right. I couldn't see any blood. Cameron is one of the best shots ever made in my life. His bull's cutting across. He's about 82 yards. and he's, but, but I can tell he's hurt. He's Yeah, <sighs> struggling. <sighs> He just, you know, you seen how them wounded elk are just after a fight, and he just, he is stopping, he goes walking, he's la- mm-hmm. laboring. And in my mind, I said, I'm not sure that that's my bull, but that's a wounded bull. And I said, but he's too far in a range, and he's like 82 yards clipping through, and there was a deadfall, and I never get, I put my, my pin where I, where I felt like I need to hit him, and there was wads of, uh, and, and it was in the brush, but above my pins was clean, so I knew my arrow would shoot over arc the brush over, and arc yeah. in there. I let that arrow go, and immediately I knew I hit him good, like mm-hmm. run off. And bro, a cold chill come over me, like, oh my god, I'm going to jail. I just, <laughs> I just shot two elk, <laughs> freaking out. I'm freaking out. And um, at the time, it, I went back, didn't even go over there. Thought I heard him fall. Mm. And dude, it was almost like I just robbed a bank. So I go back and I'm like, oh man. And I'm sitting there like. <laughs> And I went back like a little kid, like, Mama, what have I done? What? I, oh, my God. I, what do I do? My buddy, I, when they get back, what do I tell them? You know? And mm-hmm. So they come back, and the guy that was producing or, or running the camera time, I said, hey, come, come here right quick. And everybody's getting out of the truck, and I run through here. And they're like, where are y'all going? I'm going up here. I said, hold on a second. I, I, I was going to show, you know. I run there. I said, man. And, and I went to where the, I'd hit, shot. You could see, I saw where he lunged. I said, man, will you do me a favor? Will you find me, see if you see any blood? And so he goes on the opposite where the bull had been walking from. Come he said, from. There, there's blood. Oh. He said, there's blood. And I said, okay. He said, <laughs> he said, God, there's good blood. And I said, man, I think I just shot my bull. Mm-hmm. He said, what? So we I come back, and I, and I told the guys, and a guy named Perry Hunsaker was there. I said, Perry, I just got another arrow. I'm pretty sure my bull are a wounded bull. And sure enough, we went over there. This bull went about 70 yards. My bull laying dead. I put another arrow in him, and the whole time I'm like, "Man, I got choked." I'm like, "Mama, there go, Mama." Yeah. Then brought me some victory on that, and it she gave bailed me, you out on that she one. She did. Yeah. And it was the weirdest, most uh, surreal thing. So, so yeah, you never get over it. You, you know, I still think about mom. I, I still I'll be on the farm or have a nice meal with my family, and I, you know, like, mm-hmm. man, mom wished she was here. You know, so it, you, you know, just people like that have such an amazing impact. Yeah, like your dad with you, and I don't know. Yeah, it's crazy. No, it's, uh, I, I just know that, that that seemed like a critical time, obviously a critical time, you, you lose your mom, but you used it, what I'm, I think that what I take away from that is you used it for positive. Correct. You know, some people get heartbroken or lose people they love or maybe get a divorce or relationship or whatever, and they go the other way. Yeah. You know, then they're the victim their whole life. And, and instead of, um, instead of that, you were like, I'm better at football. I'm going to do this for, mm-hmm. you know, I'm going to talk to my, you know, pray to my mom or talk to my mom and see if she can help me. And like, keep that as a, just as a, a positive instead of a why me. And maybe you had That's the, why, maybe you had the why me moments. I don't know, but. 
Yeah, I, I have had some of those why. Matter of fact, the biggest mistakes that I've ever made was in the why me or justify an action because mm. of the way I was treated. You know, it could mm. it could be in in bad marriage. It could be in a situation where a friend. You know, and I've learned that because you know I think about people. You know, like I'm, I I meet you know people that are addicted to drugs, and you see these uh, scroll come across or, or as you're looking on you know, a feed on Instagram or, you know, TikTok or whatever you're looking at, you'll see these interviews where they're interviewing homeless people that are addicts. And it's easy to quickly see and say, man, what are they thinking? But obviously that was a pivotal point to where they were so hurt and so down and out that they turned to something. Or it could have been that it was just a, they were in a pretty happy time, wrong party, having yeah. a good time with their buddies yeah. and try something crystal meth new. for the first time and mm -hmm. it just grabs hold to them. But I think most of my friends I know, they, they had something tragic happen mm -hmm. and they took a wrong turn. So they turned to a crutch. And uh, in my life, I've done that. You know, it's like and every time I realize I justified this because of something that happened to me or the way I was being treated. But I was just as wrong as who you reacted treated. wrong. I reacted yeah. wrong. So 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 I that took a lot of maturity, too. So mm -hmm. so I never had that happen with my mom. It wasn't like I was so down and out like, dude, I'm just going to go to. Yeah. get on some cocaine and go party and just forget what, get the world. I, I, you know, I, I think there's a reason pain is there sometimes. Um, you know, we feel it, you know, your legs hurting, you let you know, I, you definitely, uh, you got to definitely take something for the pain, but that, that, you know, if, if there's something hurting in your heart or something hurting in a relationship, you know, you gotta, you gotta look, well, what, what is this? And mm -hmm. sometimes it can be some, it might be some mental illness or something, but, yeah. in, some, but in a lot of cases it's, there's something that needs to be fixed there. Right. And uh, so inevitably you can turn to the wrong thing to fix it and it just... To mask it. Yeah. And then all of a sudden the problem that you went to fix ain't even a problem. Now you got this. Now you got so, a real problem. Uh, and I've done yeah. that. I've mm -hmm. done that. So I've made a lot of mistakes that way, but I, I'm, I'm a lot wiser now as to know that, hey man, this sucks. But you just, like you're talking about Joe Rogan, you, you go you go hug that person yeah. that wronged you rather than... Yeah, I get him. I mean, look at Tupac and Biggie Smalls. They're both dead. <laughs> Why? I know. They didn't have to do that. I don't uh, I guess I'm figuring out it's connected. Maybe that's a whole nother podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We, we talk about we talk about Tupac all the time, how young he was and how much he accomplished and then to be taken away. It, over something dumb. Yeah. Uh, over a beef, probably, yeah. I guess. Oh, for sure. Probably a girl. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Probably a girl or, or territory or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I used no. to, every time I walked through MGM Grand, I'd everybody thought I was goofy. I'd, I'd walk out of MGM Grand just like Tupac. Every time <laughs> I'd walk, I remember that video. Look at yeah. MGM Grand. And we, yeah. Every time we stayed there, I'd walk out. And I still do it. Was, when I walk through reception, I would do it every time. Was, wasn't it at the BET Awards or something? Is leaving that? Or, or was it a Tyson it a fight? fight? Tyson, oh, fight. Tyson, Tyson fight. That's what it was. Yeah, at the yeah. MGM Grand. Yeah. And I remember we used to stay there for the shot show. Yeah, yeah. And I'd walk out of the lobby every time people would laugh. Like, what are you doing? I'm tupac baby. <laughs> I was... I did have, uh, this is my own question. What do you think is the biggest threat to hunting's future? Antis, politics, or fellow hunters tearing each other down? <laughs> I think fellow hunters tearing each other down. I yeah. really do. I, and, and political unjust. I think things sneak up on us, uh, like the Colorado Wolf situation. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's some organizations that fight it good. But, man, we have got to do better as in, a, in the hunting community of... Of, of kind of picking each other out, but also bringing that good accountability to the people who need it. There right. are some people doing some things that's just pretty ruthless. They're not hunting out of the joy of hunting. They're hunting because they feel like this is a lane that maybe can get them some fame. They're, mm -hmm. they're in it because maybe it's the last thing. Maybe they weren't that good as a motocross rider. Uh, maybe right. they wasn't that good at singing. And then I was like, wait a minute. Maybe they weren't I, hot enough to be a model. Yeah, wasn't quite <laughs> hot enough. You know, it, it maybe yeah. it's this or that. And and I'm like, wait a minute, we can go, I can go buy some airtime over at Outdoor Channel and do me a show, mm -hmm. or I can pretend that I know about shooting a bow, or start talking the lingo, and you can create a lot of facade. Um, but but inevitably, I think we're in a good place, and I have seen it, especially in the last, I would say, three or four years. I've seen it, and. Uh, and following you in the culture of hunting and the people you're hanging with, it seems to me there's been a little bit of shift where you and I grew up as kids hunting. So mm -hmm. absolutely, if we get to go to the Deseret or we get to go to a, 
really cool place to hunt elk on mm -hmm. a reservation or go to the Gila. Right. We, we absolutely going to be strategizing like, dude, man, we, there's a 360 it's a big deal. Over here. We're going to try to kill a big elk. Mm -hmm. But I'm noticing the people I'm around, they're wanting to just learn how to do it and how to eat elk chili like we did last night. Yeah. They're, they're, they're mesmerized by that. So Being I, a provider. Yes. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I, I think the trophy hunting stuff ain't over, but I'm starting to see it's less important mm -hmm. um, over all to the culture. And I think with society, politics, the way the world is, like you were telling me, there's a lot of people in New York City that love what you do. Mm -hmm. They would love a day to hang with you to see what you do, whether it's the fitness or just your life or eat the chili. Um, you know, you look at Duck Dynasty, what those guys brought to the table. There was people all over L.A. that loved yeah. those bearded, right. you know, rednecks that duck hunting from Louisiana, Willie and all the boys. And and so uh, inevitably that, there, there's some positivity to that to realize that there's culture that people want to explore. And now with the uncertain of politics and what's going on in society, can you go buy a chicken breast at the store and buy a ribeye? Mm -hmm. So I think people are starting to look at us a little different. They're yeah. not looking at us as just a stone cold killer. They're like. Hmm. That man right there can provide for his family. He put he puts meat in the freezer with his own hands. That's correct. Mm -hmm. He's not afraid. I mean, I'm I don't like a lot of the politics going on, but to be honest, I have zero fear of of uh, I do have fear of some of the stuff and and say uh, you know let's let's call it some type of weird uh, you know what what are these people that's coming across the border? Is there some type of it is odd that they're military age male? What is going on? Mm -hmm. Will we have to fight? But when it comes to just like hey, electricity goes out, and uh, whether I'm stuck out here with you or your, your family stuck with mine, mm -hmm. dude, we're gonna have a good time. It'll be all right. We're gonna we're gonna eat good. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be a little hot. You know, it might be a little warm if it's in July <laughs> and we're in Georgia. Like yeah. geez, you know. Uh, but, but I'm not worried about that. And I think a lot of people and a lot of these personalities and celebrities that are coming to you and I, they're like, hey, I don't have to kill a 370. But yeah. can you teach me the right way to shoot a bow? Mm -hmm. And if I were to shoot it in the elk, where should I aim? And how do I dress him? What's the best part to eat? Yeah. You know, can, you know I saw Ranella, you know, he ate some, he ate the eyeballs out of a caribou. Is that good? And, you know, and you're like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, mean, you, I, I don't know. I mean, we, let's start with the back strap, but yeah. if it gets. Get to hard. the eyeballs. That's all right. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so inevitably, uh, uh, maybe it was Ranella who kind of shed a light on that part at the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, inevitably, I think that's a good place hunting can go. Is this is crossing over to where it ain't just people are wanting to learn. It's, it's, I feel like it's a little more accepted in one way to a degree um, because people are. Yeah, I think Rogan's helped. Get Rogan's that helped a lot. And you know, and you know, people. There's people in our industry who like to take a shot at Joe just because he's had some amazing opportunities. That. And one thing I'll say about it is I've been with him on a lot of hunts and yeah, he's killed some giant bulls and people will say, Oh, well, it's, you know, best places he's guided. He's whatever he, he has never said, what is that bull score? In fact, he's like, there'd be a one horn bull that yeah. broke off its whole one side it might be a a little six point on the other side and he'll be like can i shoot that one he right. doesn't care does, he's elk hunting does not care about any score how big it is whatever he just loves to hunt so it's like to that rem, your point reminded me of that like we've been so infatuated with score for so long and it was all about you know we got guys out there like uh, 200 inch buck i killed this many 200 inch bucks i think it is getting to a, it's shifting a little to where it's like just being that provider just being self-sufficient and that's that's the draw instead of the score of these animals and because joe is such a, a vocal supporter of hunting and why it's important it's great that he he never has mentioned score right. i've never heard him say anything about a score of a, of a bull he's killed one time. A hundred percent. Yeah. It, it, it hit me to, it hit me too. Uh, last night when we were talking, we were just talking about hunts. You asked me if I had anything coming up and I said, well, we're getting ready to go Turkey, you know, March. And I said, and also we're, a, I might go hog hunting or something. You said, man, I'm going hog hunting too. And so it's like, yeah, me and Renell and Joe might go hog. Now think about it. Who, who's going to go weigh the hogs or measure tusks. 
But who would want to be in that camp? How fun would that be yeah, to be I'm hanging pumped. out? And so uh, to be with Rogan and Ranella and, and I can only imagine the campfires and the, the BS, the sarcasm and, and the cutting up. And again, there's your trophy mm-hmm. uh, where I got some buddies that are going to chase a big whitetail. And man, I love kill a big whitetail. You and I both have shot some really nice high scoring whitetails. So I don't want to be that guy. Like you said, well, it's easy for y'all because y'all have done yeah. it. Um, but man, it's 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 almost like uh, I, I I got some friends that's got some lonely, dusty trophy rooms, man, and they have to go in there and drink their expensive bourbon and cigar and look at the, look at it and like nobody wants to come hang with you, man, because you're an asshole. You are so driven, yeah. To, you can't even make love to this animal. Yeah. Matter of fact, your wife didn't even make love to you more because you killed it. Yeah. She she, she hates you for it too. Right. You, th- that. Yeah. Three eighty meant more to you than her. Yeah. Or friendship and um. But when I say that, I get it because mm-hmm. I've I've never crossed that line to get to that area. Mm-hmm. But I've been close a few times. Yeah, boy, you I've been right over. on it. I picked like, oh, wait a minute, come back over. But you know, you know what's interesting to me is so we've been together now for two days, hanging out, shooting bows. Other than the bull, you talked about that your mom helped you find and get that other arrow in. We haven't talked about a, a, a score of an animal. No, nope. a it, it it's just been about our love of what we do. Yep. So it's like, yeah, we hunt and we kill. That is how you define yourself as a hunter, but that's not, it's everything else. It, it don't, it don't. I, I'm looking here. I mean, like if we did, I, I'm, I'm pretty well versed on understanding elk scores. There is some high scoring elk that you killed in this room. And, um, but what's cool about it is my, my, point on that would be like congrats congratulations to you because i know that was a trophy it don't make me love or like you anymore because I, I you know i'm gonna love and like you because i know the man you are and i'm just happy for it, it gets back to a financial thing i'm just happy for you mm-hmm. it doesn't you know y- your kid didn't love you anymore your wife didn't say now you are <laughs> the sexiest beast alive you killed right. that big elk and um and i think that's what people miss they think people are going to look at them different to a degree but I think it's the, the whole journey, uh, it, inevitably, uh, to where I, I'm just happy for you and a goal. And, and and I can look at it like, holy cow, Cameron, what did that score? That's a giant. Where did you get it? You know, we could get to that point if we had more time. But right. the most important things is like, what's been up? Where has yeah. it been going our journey? I know you're good. I know you're a good elk hunter. So I know if you're in the mountain, you're probably going to have a chance to be successful. And uh, and so inevitably, I'm not su- I'm not surprised by this you are you already you already had me as a friend <laughs> and a fan without having to do that even. right that makes sense yeah if yeah that makes sense no it does i mean i just think that you know what what and it's just it's not like we're trying to prove anything like what's important to us but what's important to us comes out yeah and it, and it wasn't do you see oh do you see this one this one scored blah 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 because i've you know, I know you have too. I've been in camp. Nothing has turned me off worse than I remember. I was in this camp in Colorado, and this guy showed me this video, and he's just like, "He goes, you think this bull would score three fifty three? And I'm like, "I, I, I don't, know. I have no idea." He's like, "Cause I, I, I killed a three fifty three, and if this one, they, they wanted me to kill this one, and if this one doesn't score over that, then I'm gonna be pissed off." And I was just like, "I said, who cares?" I said, "Who cares what that bull? Do you want to kill that bull or not?" Yeah. I was just pissed, and it's like. I almost, I don't know if I almost got kicked off there because it's a great place, but God, that made me upset. I'm it's the just same like, way, man. I'm just like, it doesn't fucking matter what it scores. Exactly. What does it matter? It's almost like the biggest bull I ever shot was, he was right at 380. And um, again, it was it was on the Gila. That's and a I, big bull, by the way. Oh, That's that was huge. Such a, and I got him with my bow, <laughs> and I was so happy. Uh, I, I I didn't know how big this bull was gonna be. Mm. We'd we'd seen him, been hunting him, and and oddly enough, that Joker had an arrow, had a Carbon Express. He had been shot the year before mm. in it. It was the craziest thing when we we packed him out. But um, they're tough animals. God, they're so resilient. But uh, I remember that night we were sitting around an old fire out there in New Mexico, and uh, one of my friends said. Man, what you gonna do now, Waddell? You done killed you a three eighty with your bow. What you gonna do now? What you, I said, kill the first two sixty I see that comes <laughs> yeah. bugling in. I said, yeah. you know, it's almost like I feel like I can go down now. That's like I did yeah, this. Got, I don't yeah. want to beat it. 
that was the pinnacle. Uh, <laughs> right. It's like I'm, I'm good, you know. It make it almost gives me more secure I security understand. to go somewhere and hunt, you know. I understand that. Well, uh, I just looked at the time. I got to get you over to the airport, but Michael, it's been a huge honor to have you here my, in my home and to share these stories with you. Again, I've looked up to you for decades. For decades, oh, wow. you've been this this icon in the industry. Maybe you didn't start as an icon, but you are definitely the the biggest TV icon in hunting that I've that might ever be now for sure because of how the industry's changed or the networks changed. But it's you know so much respect for what you've built, what you do, who you are. Thank you for coming. Thank you for sitting down and man. talking bow hunting with me. Thank you, I, I'm Cameron. Same thing, man. I can echo the same sentiments. It's been uh, I knew it'd be fun. But it's been even more special, almost to the point of where, um, I don't know, man, I feel like it just rekindled everything that we've had a chance to see each other do. And now it's just like I'm looking forward to, to doing more. And uh, officially, that way we can't get out of it. I'm definitely, I heard you had never hunted a turkey. i got to get you on a fun, well, that's what we have to do. Maybe we we'll yeah. just have to get together a, a big group of some of our, our friends and uh, yeah. go chase some turkeys and do something laid back. And I'm sure we could pick up another or bunch elk. of stories. I ain't afraid. You ain't got to twist my arm too hard on the way. We got to make up for last year. That's you had right. That, you had that tough year last year. Exactly. That's, but that's bow hunting. As, that is. as we know, people people think that, hey, you just show up and the animals die. We've got to right. earn that shit. So anyway, thank you, Michael. Big honor. Let's uh, let's keep it going. Thank you, Cameron. Right. Appreciate it, buddy. All right. Keep hammering, guys. Every step I take, I move my truth. Every time they tell me, stop, I use. Every comment, hate, that makes my feel. Gather up my energy and boom. I hear them talking, saying the way that I move is so reckless. That is a part of my mind I've been blessed with. Giving my blood so I am relentless. My fault, they want someone to blame. They sent their hate, it fuels my pace. I am Roy Tuff, I am the change, the few endure. Feeling like Cam Haynes.